Good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item in the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item four and any future consideration of evidence on the draft budget in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, the second item of business today is to hear evidence from two panels in relation to the committee's scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19. Firstly, we will hear from Marine Scotland. So can I can welcome uh, Graham Black, Mike Palmer and Michael McLeod. Uh, members, as you can imagine, have a series of questions to put to you, gentlemen. So we will kick that off uh, with John Scott. Uh, good morning. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. Um, in a general sense, my first question is why has Marine Scotland moved to a simplified operating model in comparison to the 2013-16 strategic framework and what consultation was undertaken to inform this move? I, 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 must admit, I, I, can't, I can't recall exactly what consultation took place. We are not, of course, we are part of core Scottish Government in Marine Scotland. We're not a, an agency, so, so we would normally be expecting to, to fall into line with the, the normal operating practice of, of Scottish Government departments. Um, we, we intend to be as, as open and transparent as we can about what our plans are, and we will be discussing those with all interested parties and stakeholders in, in due course, uh, but it not necessarily following that particular pattern again in the future. But uh, I don't think it will, it will take away from the, the openness of our planning going forward. Right, which takes me nicely to the, the, the language you use, and I'm just interested to know what um, focused multi-channel stakeholder engagement means, uh, <laughs> as well as real partnership with delivery partners, and, and what's different from what you're doing before in that regard? Well, I, I mean, you're right, it does sound a little bit civil service-y language, that, my apologies. Ah, so just what does it mean? Uh, it, it means that we're going to be engaging with a wide range of stakeholders, both within government, obviously, but also beyond government. We have uh, a number of forum. We have a marine strategic forum. We have set up a, a separate um, stakeholder engagement group on Brexit, for example, because of the, the particular issues around Brexit. But it really is just about how widespread our engagement with stakeholders is going to be. We're not, we're not closing off any avenue. We're trying to engage with everyone, both in terms of uh, the, the Scottish environment and, of course, also with the, the UK and EU environment. So uh, it, I'm afraid it, it, you're, you're right, it is, it is slightly uh, um, uh, unspecific in, in terms mm -hmm. of, of what it means going forward. I think it's more about our general direction of travel, which is to be as open and, and engaging with stakeholders as we can. OK, thank you. Um, so, work programme, uh, a more detailed set of practical objectives is published. And when will your next annual uh, review be published? When will that be published? Well, we'll, our plan for next year is now already underway, so we anticipate being able to publish that sometime in, in the new year, probably, um, I would think, April. March or April, I would think, would be, would be the time we're, we're doing that. As you can imagine, there's quite a lot of planning going on around next year in view of the... Uh, the added complexities that Brexit is bringing to us in terms of where we're going forward. So we have quite a lot of strategic thinking that we're currently doing about the longer term future of Marine Scotland and, and how we're going to address the, the issues that concern us. Do you want to tell us just a little about any specific concerns? Sure. I mean, headline I, I, concerns you might have. I, I, is that in, in a Brexit context or more generally, I think? Uh, we'll, we'll interact on each yeah. other, but okay. whatever suits you best to tell us. I mean, I think we all recognise, for example, that, that you know, there are budgetary pressures and there will continue to be budgetary pressures going forward uh, in, in, in all areas of government. But we have been looking and intending to look more closely at what our charging policy is. You know, what is it Marine Scotland charges for? What does it charge? And what, what, to what use do we put that money? Uh, so we will be looking at options and we'll be talking to ministers about what options there might be around charging for some of our activity going forward. Um, and if we did charge, what that would be and how we would use the money, for example, in terms of science research or other compliance activities, for example. Um, so that's one of the, the central areas that we're looking at. We're also, I think, uh, might, might have been mentioned before um, in, in, in front of uh, the committee that we're looking at what our, our overall performance measures are. Um, our, our national performance measure is very much um, couched in terms of um, fishing policy. 
uh, and we need to perhaps to have a wider range of performance measures uh, around fishing, yes, around the environment and around healthy seas. So we're trying to, uh, if you like, re-establish what our core aims are on a broader area so that we can actually be, be measured against those. Those are two of the areas, and I, I know that I'll, I'll come back to some of the others. Right, I'm sure others will pursue those with you, but thanks, meantime. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's look at the funding you do have at the moment, uh, and not what you might generate in future. Yep. After statutory duties and legally committed funds are allocated, we're told that you allocate your budget, and I quote, on a priority basis, which is determined through a series of planning events. Can you, in percentage terms, outline for the committee how much of your budget's left once you've gone through that initial process? Um, who attends these planning events and what the current priorities are? Uh, the, the planning events um, that we've instituted this year have been uh, primarily internal in terms of the actual discussion, but obviously all of the people bringing to that meeting their, their knowledge of what stakeholders are actually looking for as well. Uh, so primarily we bring all the bits of my, my primary Marine Scotland together. We ask each of the areas to identify where the, the, their priorities are and what their pressure points are. And then we have a Marine Scotland discussion around um, where those priorities lie vis-a-vis -vis other things that are on the table and what actually has to be at the top of the priority table and therefore, inevitably, what has to be either delayed or deprioritized going forward. To take an example, we had a discussion last week um, uh, with, with uh, senior leaders across Marine Scotland. Clearly, in, in, in 1819, Brexit-related issues are going to be very much at the top of our priority list um, because of the, their, their eminence and their significance across the whole marine area. Uh, so the question is there, therefore, what do we need in order to make sure that we can have the greatest degree of influence on what happens around that? And, and what does that mean for the rest of our core business? And in terms of the percentage of the budget that's left after that initial process? Well, I mean, I, I, if you can imagine a, a, a budget process, it's, it's rather like most budget processes. Most of the bids and the, the actually add up to more than the money that we're actually going to have in the first place. So uh, the, the, it's primarily about trying to match what we know the funding is going to be to what our priorities are so that we make conscious and rational decisions about what we can do and what we can't do, rather than just trying to do everything and see which plate falls off when we're spinning it, I think. So is that a roundabout way of saying that once you've assessed your priorities, there's nothing left? There's nothing left. Right, OK. Um, I, and I suppose I would never... You know, there are lots of things we would always like to do in the marine environment, so you know, there are hmm. always plenty of things that we'd like to spend money on. Are you satisfied that this kind of internal conversation is the best way to, to figure out a way forward in budget terms? Do you not think that reaching out to external stakeholders in a more obvious uh, way might generate some fresh thinking that would be useful to the organisation? And I think we do. I think we're, each of the areas of Marine Scotland and, and myself talk regularly to a, a, a very wide range of stakeholders about what their priorities are, uh, what they, they, they feel is, is top of the agenda at the moment. It is just a question of balancing all those things across Marine Scotland. If, you know, it would be nice to be able to give every stakeholder what they want, uh, but we know, in fact, that in, in the real world, we're going to have to balance those priorities and, and decide what we can achieve and what we can't. And, and particularly with next year being a bit of an unusual year, you know, we, we had to make sure that we were able to deliver the very top level priorities. Okay. Um, what, let's take forward the issue of prioritisation. In written evidence to the committee, you said, um, as an organisation, you said, Marine Scotland is currently reviewing a number of key areas of activity to determine whether best value is being derived from the way resources are currently being allocated. That suggests uh, um, to me that some areas of activity, perhaps by necessity, will be reduced. If that is the case, uh, how will you determine what areas um, will be reduced and how prioritisation is taken forward? Yeah, I mean, some of it might be about reduced, some of it may be about doing things in, in different ways. Um, if, I, if I can take our compliance activity, for example, um, heavily reliant on what we have in terms of our ships, our aircraft and our, our network of very professional staff that are, that are spread around the coast of, of Scotland. Uh, the question is, could we do different things in different ways? Could we use technology in order to perhaps uh, ensure co compliance in a slightly different way? So in, in that way, we will be looking to see whether our, our compliance work can be done in, in not just next year, but in, in 5, 10, 15 years. Is it, will we be wanting to do it in exactly the same way or will there be different methods? For, you know, we're probably all, all aware of, of cameras on, on some of the fishing boats that we've been experimenting with. Is that a way ahead or not? We've not reached any conclusions on that, but that's the sort of technology that is, is available now that was perhaps not available 
um, before. And it's encouraging to hear that you're looking to more effective ways of working. But in the immediate term, mm. uh, the budget that you anticipate having yeah. for the, the forthcoming year, uh, is it adequate to do what you have to do in the here and now? Uh, like any director, I suppose I would always like more money to spend on more things that I would, I would like to have. But we recognise that there are national priorities and we have to live within a, a, a budget that applies to all things across Scottish Government. So I think we have enough um, to do what we need to do. We, we had a very good planning meeting at which we decided where our priorities lay. It, it may mean uh, that things, other things are, are perhaps slower than they, we, we would, that we would like them. Uh, it may mean that we have to... Uh, move things at the margins in terms of, of, of where we use our resources. But there was nothing fundamental about what Marine Scotland wanted to do or intended to do next year that we felt we were, we'd be unable to deliver. OK. Finlay Cars. Convener, just very quickly, do you, uh, can you budget for spend to save? So, for example, you know, discuss technology. I know certainly GPS is something that has come down greatly in mm -hmm. price. And when you look at the, the budget spent on... Uh, the, the marine protection vessel, you know, of between two and a half and three million pounds. Can you, within your budget, spend to save and, and, and look at maybe uh, installing GPS devices and, and boats at the moment that don't need to carry them to reduce the, the workload of the protection? I mean, I mean, we can try and do that, but we have a very sophisticated satellite monitoring system that enables us to track vessels uh, anywhere, in fact, anywhere in the world, in fact, uh, uh, but, but certainly within our, our waters, we have a very good system for doing that. And at the end of the day, it's one thing tracking ves uh, vessels, but somebody has to be there to actually, um, you know, take action if we have to take action. So um, the vessels are expensive, um, but on the other hand, we, you know, we have three major uh, protection vessels as well as, as well as the, some of the smaller ribs. Um, but if we didn't have those, once we had tracked that a vessel was needed action, how would we actually take the action? You know, not all of these are necessarily Scottish vessels that will be coming to Scottish ports where we can deal with them uh, uh, at that stage. So we actually still have to have something I was going to say boots on the ground, but it's not really quite, uh, quite appropriate in this for the case. But yeah, we have to have something that is physically able to uh, intervene as well. S same, you know, we use our, our aircraft, for example, very much in the, that, that monitoring area, and that helps us direct the, the ships to the most effective way, places that they, they can ha have some good contribution towards compliance. But do, do you feel that you could invest in technology now that would save in the future? I think we would certainly be looking to do that, and, and I think um, you know all the uh, responses from ministers is that they're always looking for exactly that sort of idea. If, we, if, if new technology is available and we think it will actually, uh, for some investment now, it will actually have payback, then you know we've, we've always had very positive responses to that. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Angus Macdonald. Thanks, um, convener. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, morning. With regard to uh, staffing levels, um, if we could perhaps look at that briefly. Um, we've seen a drop in permanent staff from 765 when Marine Scotland was formed to 628, which is the most recent figure that the, that the committee has. So um, I'm just curious as to whether the staffing levels are anticipated to uh, remain static or change over the next five years, mm. uh, and whether that, if there is a change, whether that would impact on, uh, on Marine Scotland's activities. Yeah. I mean, staffing levels as of this precise moment, I think, are about 635. So they've probably, um, you know, there has been a period where staffing levels were reduced uh, because of budgetary pressures. It's probably more about flat at the moment. It's a bit difficult to look five years ahead at the moment for two reasons. Firstly, because our budget is not obviously not covering that, that entire period, and also because some of the fundamental reviews we're doing of what we do around compliance, what we do around science, um, I've not reached fruition yet, so I suppose we have, you know, at the moment I would like to say that all that work is in progress, and I know that's a bit, you know, it's a bit frustrating in order not, not, not to be able to give you a, a clear answer, but we do have to do some, some big thinking around this, and we have to have discussions with stakeholders about what the implications are of doing some of these things. So, so that, that, I would hope that this will become clearer as it, as it goes on. We're not looking at it at the moment saying we have to cut staff by X, Y or Z, um, or, or I would anticipate as being broadly flat at the moment uh, in terms of where our staffing is. But that, I think, covers the fact that we've got those longer-term um, pressures. Uh, we know, for example, that Brexit is likely to bring pressures uh, in terms of long-term staffing as well. So until we, we have a clearer idea of what those are, it's a bit difficult for us to give a longer-term 
uh, answer on that one. Sorry, I'm sorry, it's a bit, it's a bit big, but there, there are so many uncertainties around some of these areas at the moment. Indeed, yeah. Okay, no, uh, your, your answer is appreciated. Um, looking specifically at the issue of uh, the crews on the, the, the marine um, protection vessels or the fishery protection vessels, um, prior to the summer recess, the committee was uh, following closely the dispute between the crews and, uh, and uh, Marine Scotland. Um, now I'm pleased to see that the issue has uh, been resolved, but can you uh, perhaps give the committee an update on the dispute and whether you expect further challenges in this regard? Um, well, um, I, I, I'll certainly be very happy to update you. Um, just to recap a little bit, um, a few years ago we were, we were having great difficulty in recruiting and retaining um, people on the boats. Um, there was a lot of competition, uh, there was a lot of activity, there were a lot of places that people were, were, were moving from Marine Scotland to other jobs. Um, so we introduced on a temporary basis a retention allowance, uh, initially of £5,000 for a limited period because it was seen to be a, 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 a a necessity in order to maintain our, our ability to, to operate the boats. As you can imagine, with, with the, the vessels, unless you have all of the relevant trained crew, uh, you, you, you just can't take them to sea at all. So it's a, it's a sort of all or nothing element in terms of the crew. So a, a £5,000 retention um, allowance was introduced at that stage on a temporary basis. That was due to come to an end. Uh, and it was recognised that um, that was going to be quite a big cliff edge for all of the staff moving from 5,000 um, uh, retention allowance to nothing. So it was extended for a period of 2,000, but again, that was on a temporary basis. And we got to the stage where we were having um, serious um, disputes, you were, you were saying, uh, certainly uh, hard conversations with, with the, the, the trade unions and the staff about what, what the position would be going forward. Um, fair to say the unions thought that the £5,000 retention allowance should be maintained uh, at that level. We also had to balance that with the impact it would have on the Marine Scotland budget, because if we were spending that money on that, we were not sp uh, spending it on something else. So we had some uh, lots of discussions with the, the trade unions and their representatives, uh, and eventually we came to, uh, uh, I think, a, a reasonable compromise position, um, whereby the, the allowance has been maintained at um, just over £3,000. Uh, it will certainly be there for three years or so, assuming outside conditions don't change. You know, the, the, the market changes sometimes. But we will also be looking to see whether we can get a longer term answer to the the, uh, the payment uh, issue around around crew. I think we did. I have to say, it, it demonstrates the limitations of some of these short term retention allowances because um, once people are, are used to to having that amount of money every month to then suddenly come along and say you're taking it away uh, you know most people live more or less at uh, at, the, at their income levels and, and their spend expenditure levels are, are similar so it's quite difficult for people when you suddenly come along and say that that money will no longer be there so it, it does does i think demonstrate that sometimes these short-term answers can create some longer-term problems i think we're in a good place now we're, we're, we've got a, i think a good relationship with the, the trade unions we want to do more, not just about pay, but about things like training, uh, about making sure that we've got the proper career opportunities for people on the, on the ships as well. Um, Recognise it's not giving everyone everything they want, uh, and, and you know I, I, I accept that. But I think we're not in a much better place now. Okay, thank you. J just for the record, the saving of two thousand pounds per person that you've indicated, what's that worth in broad terms to a Marine Scotland's budget? Oh, I'm trying to. Well. Um, we have about, uh, it must be about £300,000, uh, uh, I would think. Okay. But I might have to check on the exact okay. number. Donald Cameron. Thank you. Um, can I associate myself with the comments of Angus MacDonald um, representing the Highlands and Islands? It was obviously a very acute issue in the summer. Um, could I ask some questions that are linked to that? Um, firstly, do you see recruitment and retention being an ongoing problem in the next five years? And, sec and secondly, um, uh, given that Marine Scotland will be doing more, we, I'm sure we'll come on and talk about the network of MPAs, etc. Do you think you'll need to employ more staff in the next five years? Um, in terms of employing more staff, I, I think I, I, 
I would probably say I, I don't know at the moment. Uh, you know, I, would, I would like to be able to say yes or no. I think some of the challenges um, uh, we'd be forcing is in that direction. Other aspects, such as new technology, might be might be going in the opposite direction. Um, sorry, the first question was... Sorry, wait, just in terms of it linked to that, in re recruitment and retention, oh, yes. is uh, that an ongoing issue? I mean, the, the reason we, we, we introduced the recruitment retention um, uh, award for um, staff at that, a time where we were losing people heavily... Um, that position has changed. Uh, we still have a, a, a fair churn of staff a, a, across the boats, but not in anything like the same degree. It's not getting in the way of operational delivery. We are certainly able to recruit. Probably true to say that uh, retention is still more of an issue at, at some of the, the higher officer grades, um, you know, because there are, there are obviously quite a lot of opportunities and options for people who are trained in the way that, that we train, um, um, you know, the senior staff in the boats, but at the moment it's not an issue that is that is um, causing us major concerns. But we will constantly keep an eye on it. And can I can I just lastly ask? You mentioned Brexit. Um, do you have uh, within the Marine Scotland workforce many uh, non-UK EU nationals working? Uh, yes, we do. Um, both in terms of on the the ships and in the science area. I think about sixteen percent or so of our. our Sorry? 12%. 12 12% 12 of our, 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 our staff at the science. And I have to say they make a huge contribution. Uh, you know, we get some excellent people in, into the organisation from, from the EU. So uh, um, trying to ensure that, you know, they, they were clearly very uncomfortable when uh, uh, Brexit first came up and, and the uncertainty around their own position. Uh, I still think some of that lingers on. And it certainly um, is one of our aims is to make sure that we still have access to the very best people because in areas like science... You know, there isn't there isn't really a, an option to having really good people in, in doing the job. Thank you. As we've strayed into EU matters, uh, David Stewart, do you want to come in on this? Uh, thank you. you know, could I continue the theme that Donald Cameron raised about Brexit, not least because the committee's just returned, as we know, from from Brussels, so yes. we're fresh with all things uh, mm -hmm. uh, European. Um, in your submission, you talk about the important role of data exchange in collaboration with other EU countries. Mm. Uh, what assessment have you made uh, about future collaboration once the EU exits, once the UK exits uh, the EU? Um, well, it's, it's quite difficult at the moment to know what access we will have to other data and, and the, the degree to which we will get uh, cooperation from other European countries following Brexit. Um, I mean, can I perhaps ask Mike to, to give us an update on where we are on that? Yes, certainly. Um, so we are assessing at the moment the various different scenarios that we might be in, and uh, it's a very uncertain time, and uh, there's no certainty about which scenarios we find ourselves in. But um, I, I think there's, there's, there's one kind of area of data exchange which lies outside the EU framework, if you like, in terms of Marine Scotland's um, interests. So, for example, um, in relation to fish stock assessments, um, that kind of data goes through the ICs apparatus, mm. which is external to the EU. So we would expect to continue to be playing into that. Um, uh, and for um, Brexit uh, to leave that relatively unaffected. Um, in terms of marine environment data, um, many of the fora into which we play are also external to the EU. Um, uh, so again, we would expect to that 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 kind of apparatus to continue, um, uh, and we are assessing uh, uh, through the Brexit process how we can maintain and uh, ensure that there is as frictionless a transition, if you like, through Brexit on data sharing in 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 all matters that relate to EU data sharing. So, for example. Um, in relation to compliance, um, it's vitally important that we can maintain the kind of data sharing that we currently have uh, between the UK and other member states uh, around <clears throat> fisheries enforcement, for example. Um, and that's very much one of the objectives that we would have mm. in the work that we do around Brexit. Right. So we haven't yet got to those kinds of technical discussions yeah. on exactly how that would happen, but that's certainly something that yeah. we've assessed as important. Does Marine Scotland access rise in 2020 at all? In terms of... So, the, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So clearly that's another aspect. Obviously Absolutely. I'm conscious that there are some yeah. uh, countries out with the EU that access a rise in 2020, and um, obviously we've discussed, we met with some of the EFTA countries just yesterday, in fact, about, about that. Is it, 
well, it's probably too early for you to have an assessment, but clearly Horizon 2020 is vitally important for academic research. What would the effect of not having access to that programme be for your operation? So um, we, we have certainly had a look at all of the um, EU source funding streams um, uh, that include Horizon 2020. We also have the EMFF, which is a very important um, EU source funding stream. Uh, the, the impact would be material, certainly material, and in some cases quite significant for us. Um, uh, so that is definitely uh, in and among our priorities and objectives to ensure that we have a continuity of funding going forward. Mm. Um, uh, as we go through mm. um, EU exit and, mm. uh, and ensure that um, uh, we have as frictionless yeah. a, um, a transition through. We don't yet have clarity clearly through the EU exit process on what the, what, what, what the, what, what the future funding arrangements yeah. would be. And yet, Donna Cameron touched on the general issue of recruitment, and I know how vitally important getting top-level international scientists are to Marine Scotland. Clearly, mobility of labour is a key issue in the current negotiations. Uh, I mean, how damaging would it be if you lost access to current uh, EU top-level scientists in terms of recruitment? I, I think it would be very, very damaging. And, and, and of course, we also get uh, quite a lot of, if, if you like, early scientists who, you know, who have promise, who develop working in, in, uh, in marine science in Scotland. Um, so it would be very damaging. I mean, in the long run, I suppose we would have to consider how we uh, grew more home, homegrown talent. But in terms of the scientific area, you know, you're, you're looking for the best people from wherever they are. So it would be mm. an issue. And, and certainly, as, as Mike said, the, the funding issue is one that we, we are still concerned about because there's a, there's a significant amount of um, European funding that, that supports both what we do in terms of data collection and what we do generally uh, 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 across Marine Scotland. So I think it is uh, it's certainly one of our major concerns mm. and one of the areas where we would like more clarity as soon as, as, soon as we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kavita. I'm going to let Richard Loyal in to explore the EMFF funding issue, but just before that, Claudia Beamish is a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning to you all. Uh, could I just ask you, Mike Palmer, you, you highlighted the other fora that uh, Marine Scotland and Scottish Government are involved with, um, uh, parallel with the EU, and I wonder if, for the record, you could say um, what those are and something briefly about how um, that helps us to work together to um, do the whole range of, of issues um, that are related to the, the our marine environment and our, our way forward for development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, I mentioned ICES, which is um, the, the International Forum uh, uh, for Coordinating uh, Data Collection and Analysis and Sampling of, of uh, basically for, for fish stocks. Um, uh, and that's vital across the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, in, in terms of uh, um, managing sustainable fisheries. So um, our scientists play an active role in the IC's working groups. Um, there is also OSPAR, um, uh, which is a, a, a marine environment forum, um, which we are um, very actively engaged in. And I don't know if Michael might want to say a few more words about that. Um, uh, I, I would guess that would be the main marine environment for international forum that we would play into. Yeah, yes, um, so if I could just add to what Mike said. So a good example at OSPAR is that in 2017 there was an intermediate assessment of the status of the North East Atlantic. Now that process involved all the contracting parties pooling uh, both their, their data, so monitoring data together, pooling their expertise in terms of scientists working together to come up with indicators to measure the state of environment and then pooling it all together into an assessment which simply wouldn't be possible without that collaboration and pooling knowledge, expertise and data all together um, in, in one sort of forum. Thank you. I, I, can I just add on that? I mean, I think in, in the science area, international cooperation is just fundamental. You know, fish no, no, no boundaries, you know, they're, they're, and, and we need to have that international cooperation. And Scotland, I think, has traditionally uh, punched above its weight in terms of our contribution towards all of that, and, and we would certainly be intending that that continue to be the case. But uh, certainly access to uh, good quality scientists is, is key to that. Okay. Richard Lyle. 
Yes, good morning, Gen uh, gentlemen. Thanks, convener. Mr. Black, you actually touched partly on the question I was going to ask, but we all know that the UK voted to leave the EU, but Scotland voted to stay. We're now seeing the cost of this decision, in particular, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund (EMFF) provides Scotland with 107.7 million euros, as well as a contribution this EU funding makes to the maritime sector, coastal communities in Scotland. It also accounts for £30 million of Marine Scotland's expenditure on science, data and compliance. Since you will lose this EU funding, this important funding, uh, have you had any assurances that the £30 million of Marine Scotland's expenditure on science, data and compliance that comes from the EMFF will be replaced by domestic funding? Um, might, might want to add something to this, but, but no, we've got no assurances really beyond um, where we are at the moment that, that there is a commitment to meet anything that, that we have committed for in, in under EMFF, even after we've, we've gone out of Brexit. But that is only a short-term issue, so I think it is uh, it's something we've been pressing for. We do want uh, assurance about where we're going to be longer term, because we do need to be planning long term, uh, and I think our stakeholders re uh, rely on it. You're absolutely right. EMF has a, has a very widespread impact, both within Marine Scotland, where obviously I'm, I've got concern, but more widely around coastal communities and, and, and industries concerned with, uh, with marine masters across Scotland. So it is a very big issue for us, as yet uh, no certainty around the long term replacement of that funding from, from anywhere. I think as yet there's no certainty uh, around the, the, the Brexit negotiations, Absolutely. but uh, uh, it changes every day. But anyway, you said earlier you would be charging or thinking about charging. Uh, that always interests me. Who are you going to charge and how much? Yeah, that's a very good question, and, and, that, and that I think is exactly what we, we're looking at now. I, I'm not, I've not put any constraints on what we're looking at. I'm, I'm looking at all of what we're doing across Marine Scotland. Um, so that goes from the fishing industry, it goes to aquaculture, it goes to marine licensing. I think all of our activities that, that people will be, be used to dealing with. We're not saying we are going to do it. I think what we want to do is, is put the options in front of, of, of ministers and discuss with stakeholders also. It's not simply a question of charging from my viewpoint, it's what the offer would be. So in other words, if we were charging, what would we be saying would be different, would be better, would be quicker, would be more effective. So, so it, it can't be just a question of, um, you know, we're, we, want, we want money off you. I think it has to be part of a, an understanding so that industry <coughs> understands if it is being charged more for something, what, what they can expect to get in return. And that seems not an, an unreasonable position to, to be in, but we have to do a bit of thinking around that. Uh, sorry, I can't give you, again, get clear answers, but there is, there's no area for which is being ruled out at the moment. Uh, but I think we, you know, we need to have good discussions with ministers to, to look at what the pros and cons of all those options are. And, and, that, and that has to involve, I want to be as open with stakeholders as possible so that we actually have views from, from all uh, sectors of the community and industry on, on what they think about this. Because you, uh, you, you might think automatically that people will be completely against charging. Actually, the discussions I've already had with a number of stakeholders say, well, actually, they're not, no, they're not saying anyone you know, is looking to as, as a positive in, in some senses, but they do see some positives if they can understand that actually we can, we can manage to support what they're doing in a better way, and they can perhaps have some sort of say in, in, in how that might operate. Other countries quite often do this. You know, I, don't, I don't think we're, um, you know, we, we're trying to learn from other countries as well as, as come up with things ourselves. OK, last question. Without this funding, what activities would you have to stop or possibly stop? Gosh, um, and that, I, I think we'd have to look at all our activities, first of all, to see what we would, we would uh, deprioritize. So I think stopping things would be, would be, is quite difficult in our, in our area. You can't stop doing compliance, but you could perhaps decide to do it in a different way or to risk assess in a different way. You can't stop doing science, but you might decide that you have to prioritize one particular area and, and accept the fact that some of the scientific development would have to come from elsewhere, um, um, in either in the this, this, this Scottish community, scientific community or elsewhere. Um, you can't stop doing policy work because um, ministers still need all of that. So, unfortunately, there are no, there are no cut and dried answers, but it would certainly put us under considerable, considerable pressure to do 
Um, what we think we need to do, and I suppose from our viewpoint, the marine environment is really important from a Scottish perspective. It has a big impact in the Scottish economy. It has a really big impact on a number of, of you know, quite fragile communities around Scotland. Um, so you know, we see this as really quite important. So, and, and ministers recognise all of that. You know, the, the, the importance given to the environment by uh, Ms Cunningham, I think, has been, has been uh, very clear. The importance given to, to the economy by Mr Ewing, very clear. You know, we, I think people understand where, where the marine environment lies in the, the future of Scotland. Thank you. Uh, perhaps it might be useful to the committee if you were to write back to us uh, detailing exactly what you get in my way of EU-related funding sure. and specifically what it's spent on. That would give us a, a good hand on, on what's at stake here, if you could do that in the next yes. couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay. Mark Roscoe. On the EMFF, I mean, I know that we've made quite good progress in Scotland over the decades on conservation measures, selective gear. How significant has EMFF been in terms of funding that, that type of work? I, I think it's been very significant. Uh, you know, the, 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 you're absolutely right. It's, 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 we've done a lot of good work about being more selective in our fishing, which is a huge impact on, on, uh, on our fishing activities and on the, the, the fish stocks that we have. We are, at the moment, we're in a very good position, I think, generally. Uh, you know, fish stocks are always a, you know, some go up and some go down, but overall, the position is, is much better than it has been in the past. That's partly down to the fact that we've been able to improve techniques and improve gear. Um, EMFF has been quite central to our ability to spread that out across the industry and to, and to innovate and try out new things. So, uh, you know, we would see it as really, really very important. So if EMFF goes, where, where do you then drive that innovation? Is it about working with EFTA states? Is it about Scotland working within a UK context? I mean... I, mean, I think we would do that in any event. If, if EMFF funding was not there, I think it would just slow down development um, and... and perhaps stuff as being at the cutting edge, um, which I think is where we are at the moment. We're, we're normally seen as very advanced in terms of our techniques and, and, and abilities. And, and that's not really, you know, given a, a, a choice, I think we would rather be right at the forefront of the technology and the, the development. So I think, but working with others is already part of, of, of what we do. We will it, all, already try and steal yeah. anything from anyone else if, if we think it works. And is that lead recognised in a UK context? I think it is. I think, it, but it's probably true to say that that, that you know, fishing and marine issues is is proportionately more significant than Scotland. Well, it is true to say it's proportionately more important to Scotland than it is to in a UK context. So where where it's it it's easier for us to get attention and to be able to see where it, the impact of all this is perhaps more marginal at a UK level. Uh, uh, so you know, it's it's a difference of, of priorities perhaps. As far as this is very high priority. This on to look at MPAs and protected marine features. Mark Roscoe again. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, there's a couple of questions here. So perhaps we could start with the the network. Um, so it's been three years since SNH recommended expanding the MPA network and uh, improve its ecological coherence, adding in another four MPAs. Where are we with that? What, what, where are we with the time scale for completion? What are the implications in terms of budget? Okay. Can I ask Michael to? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's four MPAs which were um, recommended by Scottish Natural Heritage, as you point out. Um, we are currently working principally focused on MPA management measures currently. So we are, um, I'm sure many of the members of the committee will remember um, the start of last year in the last parliamentary term where we were taking forward um, some MPA management measures, which uh, caused quite a lot of um, public interest. Um, we are currently working through measures for offshore sites, um, which we are trying to deliver through the Common Fisheries Policy. And we also have to take forward some further measures for inshore sites. So uh, I'm sure we'll be having discussions about that next year. Um, we consider delivering the management measures for these existing sites to be um, of greater environmental importance than delivering further MPAs at this time. So, We've already been caught up, I suppose, by the, the resources issue, um, and we've had to make some hard choices in terms of what we do first. Um, right. And we've chosen the, the management measures for existing sites. In terms of timescales for those four sites, the current thinking is that we will take them forward in 2019, because right. um, we don't see us having the resource to do it in the next financial year, mm -hmm. so it will be financial year. Mm -hmm. 
1920. Yeah. If, if you were to if you were to roll out the management measures for the existing network and expand the network, what would be the resource requirements of you doing both at the same time? Um, I would need more staff in my team, and I would imagine that the uh, the coastal and marine team at SNH would need additional staff. Um, it was simply down to having people to do the the bureaucracy that goes with mm -hmm. these processes. Mm -hmm. How much? How much? Yeah. How many? Um, I, I don't know. I, I would need at least at least one. Okay. Possibly two. I, 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 two I think all, I, I think all this has to be in the context of the fact that we have quite a large MPA network already, and, and, and you know about twenty percent of our uh, our fees are, are are covered. So I think we 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 did you know we've moved forward very fast on it. We need to make sure that we are successfully operating in that environment uh, as well as trying to. To move forward in other areas that have been identified. So, uh, in the best of all possible worlds, we've, we've moved forward and everything as quickly as, as possible. But, but um, at the moment, you have, as, as we said earlier on, there has to be some measure of prioritisation. But we are very keen that we, we continue to identify areas where MPAs are appropriate, right. and we do actually move forward on them as quickly okay. as we can. But so it would require another two members of staff to, to do uh, that? I, I think, uh, can we write to you separately on that one, that just to, so to we, know, we, yeah. we've had a full think through of the implications of, of Great. That. And can I move on to monitoring? Um, now, you talk in your written submission about there being a, a diminishing resource um, for monitoring. Um, that's the context for, for how you approach this. Um, can you talk about what integrated MPA monitoring actually involves and where is the appropriate role for, for fishers and um, ENGOs and stakeholders and communities within that? Because there, there could ask, be a tension uh, there. Could I'll ask Michael to, to, to add to this, but I, th I, I think um, the diminishing resource is, is of, if you like, part of the plan. It was, it was always envisaged that we would, we would require fewer resources to monitor as we go on because it becomes business as usual. We have a lot of um, vessels, we have a lot of monitoring that goes on anyway, so it becomes part of our, our business as usual. Uh, and also, it does rely on a good, good deal of partnership with other people involved in the marine in, in environment to make sure that we understand what's happening and see if there's anything going wrong. But, Michael, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, we designed this, this, this MPA monitoring strategy, diminishing resource. Um, we operated when we were developing strategy was on the basis of, well, we're not going to see a budget increase, um, probably. That was our sort of pessimistic view um, of, of things. And costs of, of ship time and so on are going to go up. So your actual amount of days of monitoring resource is probably going to stagnate, possibly go down, um, certainly unlikely to increase. So we designed the strategy um, around um, that sort of bleak view um, of, of the coming years. Um, in terms of involving others, we all obviously have um, the EMFF programme, um, which uh, was successfully funded by EMFF, which will run for the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. the aim of that is to involve fishermen um, in, in those processes. Uh, in terms of the wider stakeholder community, um, we've actually very specifically put in a, a type of monitoring uh, in the strategy, which is term type zero monitoring, but it's effectively the type of monitoring that divers such as those from Sea Search do. So we go down, we go down to look and enjoy um, in, you know, beautiful locations uh, in our coastal area, but that information, what they see, if they see something that's changed, or they, or indeed even just seeing that it's still the same as the last time we were there, that's important information because it helps mm -hmm. us plan where we actually go and put our um, um, more detailed monitoring effort uh, into the marine environment. I think the comment when the Loch Caron Conservation Order came to this committee was that Marine Scotland had got lucky because they had some amateur divers out and they'd seen the, the destruction of the, of the flame shell reefs. So, I mean, is that, is, is that part of the strategy, luck? I mean, is it, how much of the, of the monitoring can we, if you had, an, in an ideal world, you want to monitor these features and these MPAs, what kind of resource would you put in place? Would it be the kind of structures you have already with partnerships and collaborations between fishers and amateur divers, or would you would you want something a bit a bit more substantial in terms of 
you know, monitoring that the state. I, I think we could, you know, we, we could always use more resources to to ensure compliance. At the moment, yes, the the Lockhan incident was um, it was very unfortunate. I don't know if it was it was about luck. Uh, I think we have a lot of people out there. It is always going to be partly to do with what Marine Scotland can do, but partly what others around you know, who are working and living in the, in the coastal communities actually actually see and, and know about as well. Uh, we're not seeing many incidents like that, um, but I think it is something that we have to keep under review. If it, if it appears to us that actually there's a lot of, uh, of problems that are emerging, uh, you know, then we might want to revisit what our direct compliance activity might be and what our direct monitoring activity might be. Uh, at the moment, it's fair to say that that you know most of those involved in the marine environment see what we're trying to do with MPAs. They agree with it. There may be local issues around what, what happens in a particular site, but I think uh, overall it's been a very positive response in, in that sense. Uh, and we're not seeing lots of examples. Uh, and, and we need to use our, the best risk analysis we have to use our resources to the best effect. And some, some of that risk analysis comes from the observations that, that people around the, the coast will, will actually give us. And, and I think that's a good thing, because I think these MPAs are about as all owning it, it's not, uh, in, you know, not just Marine Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks. Um, I'm glad to hear you. you, 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 uh, um, you recognise the, the, the local issues, but um, I wonder if you could expand on um, how you'll be monitoring the social and economic impacts of MPAs on uh, local communities alongside uh, environmental monitoring. So there was a, a report which was published at the, the start of this year, which was undertaken by my, my, my colleagues um, who are both social researchers and economists. Um, and it was quite early on because it was less than a year after the implementation of the first management measures. But I think its conclusion was that there hadn't certainly been any negative effects at that point. Now, I understand that they've agreed to do another report in 2018 to see um, how things are progressing, um, and that may also start to show benefits also um, of the management measures. Okay. Thank you. Well, will you share that report when it uh, is Absolutely. Released? Thank you. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Vina, um, could, could I just uh, ask a, a further question to you, uh, Michael, about... Um, stakeholder engagement and uh, I see uh, the, the quote that was highlighted earlier in our discussions this morning about the focus multi-channel stakeholder engagement which you have acknowledged and uh, is, is perhaps it was able to speak but very importantly um, Michael you've already highlighted today as well the, um, the public interest that there was um, which is a sort of neutral phrase um, in, in the initial MPAs, and also it's been highlighted uh, by yourself, Graham, that there were um, there might be still some local issues in relation to MPAs, and we did visit um, an MPA um, in, the, in the summer recess as a committee. So I'm very interested to know um, a bit more detail about what your stakeholder engagement arrangements are and um, how those are conducted, because there were complaints, valid or not, I don't know, about um, uh, some sectors felt that they weren't um, included appropriately um, previously for the MPA developments, um, and I'm not making a value judgment about that, I'm simply saying what came to us. So I'm interested to know how, how are they organised, how are they advertised, and what sort of feedback is given? Um, we obviously haven't been as active in, in coastal waters over the last year. Our focus has been in offshore waters, mm -hmm. which is principally engaging with um, the offshore fishing industry. The NGOs have been involved, but also the other EU member states. Next year, we'll be doing some more work in, in coastal waters, um, and we haven't exactly detailed what our stakeholder engagement plan is for that. But going back to the previous um, period, between um, the start of 2013 and early 2015, me and my team um, attended over 100 events mm -hmm. around the coast. Mm -hmm. If anything, we were guilty of over over-engaging and over-consulting 100 coastal events plus bilaterals with some sectoral interests. If anything, I, I feel that we probably overdid it in some 
some respects. Um, so that's something we're reflecting on to try and work out how best to um, engage this time around um, as we go through 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through the convener, yes, Graham. Um, uh, yes, I, I, mean, I mean, one of the things I, I particularly noticed, and as, as you know, I've been in this role for about six months, is, is the degree to which it's quite difficult to have an answer that applies right the way across Scotland, because there are those local issues which do make it uh, very different. You know, it, it's not possible always to come up with a single Scottish answer that is going to be appropriate to all the different communities around, around the coast. So I think whatever we have has, has got to recognise the fact that there will be local stakeholder involvement. Unfortunately, of course, some of these things will mean some of those local stakeholders will not get what they want because you know, we, we, we have to make decisions sometimes and, and some people will feel it's not to their, their advantage. Um, I, I, as long as we're being open about that, I think that's, that's, you know, we, we've got to accept that will be the case. But absolutely important that we have continue to have very localised um, discussions with people so we understand uh, exactly what the implications are. I, 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 I've been amazed and fascinated by the, the, the degree of difference around Scotland in terms of what the communities do and what challenges they actually face in each area. So, so uh, I'm, I've certainly moved away from the idea that we can come up with a, an answer that's going to apply across the board. Right. I think why I asked the question about feedback was particularly in relation to whether there is conflict that if perhaps people understand yes. why what they have asked for isn't going to be just uh, given to them, uh, just all of what people want, then I think it's helpful. So that's I, why I was... I, I do agree. I think, it, you know, it's one thing saying what the decision is, but we should always be able to say why we've arrived at the decision. That might not satisfy everyone, yeah. but at least they should know why. Thank you. Good. And could I just move briefly to the um, priority marine features, which I've asked um, Cabinet Secretary Cunningham about... Um, uh, earlier, earlier this year, and I understand from her response that public consultation um, is likely to happen um, around the end of 2017, which we're now at. And I was wondering if, in, in view of the fact that these um, features are extremely important, and just to highlight the issue around the enhancement of the marine environment as well as the protection of it, uh, whether you can give us any further information on developments, please. Certainly. Um, so, um, clearly, this is quite a, a challenging task. It sounds relatively simple to review and improve the protection given um, to these priority marine features out with the MPA network. It's actually quite a challenging task. So, we are in the process at the moment of trying to commission some e e external help to do a sustainability appraisal to, to underpin that work. So, that will take care of the strategic environmental assessment requirements, but also do a socioeconomic assessment and bring the two together into a holistic appraisal, which we hope will make um, stakeholder understanding um, and engagement um, easier, which I, I hope is a learning from our previous processes that um, will help bring some clarity and help. I, I think one of the challenges before was weighing up the environmental benefits against what may be socioeconomic costs. And that's always going to be a challenge because they're not like for like. But hopefully doing it this way um, will um, make that easier, um, hopefully. Um, in terms of timescales, clearly we're trying to get that commissioned right now. Um, we would envisage um, having a, a scoping report ready for consultation around about April. Um, and the reason for consulting on the scoping report is to make sure that we are taking the right approaches or considering the right approaches and that we're using the, the right data to underpin the assessments. Um, the visit assessment taking place over the summer. Can um, I just check, would that be a public consultation the, that on the scoping report? Yes, we right, will we'll make it publicly available. Normally a scoping report for strategic okay, environmental I, I assessment is sure. a closed right. process, but we'll make it an open process. But if it's bringing in the socioeconomic as well, then obviously it's important to get um, yes. views Yes, I mean, it. at that stage, the assessment won't have been done. It just will be setting out the methodologies okay. to be right. used. Okay. Uh, we'll do the assessment over the summer, which stakeholders will have opportunities to see and comment on and be involved. And that will lead us into a second consultation sometime in the autumn. And that will be where we'll be focused in on exactly what we're proposing measures to be and what the assessment has said about that. So hopefully, 
it will give us a, a clear, transparent process that people can be involved in and hopefully see why we have reached the decision that has been reached. Right, thank you. That is helpful. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate Forbes, will be followed by Stuart Stevens. Thank you. Just a, a question about compliance. You have already touched on um, monitoring, but in terms of policing MPAs, how do you promote a culture of compliance? And in particular, I'm thinking of some of the issues that have been raised with me by fishermen along the West Coast to do with the boundaries of MPAs and how clear it is for fishermen to identify where the MPA is and, and stay outside of it, which, which can prove challenging. I, I, I think we, we recognise that issue. And, and this is another area where technology, we hope, will enable us to... to be able to be able to refine things more effectively and enable fishermen to understand exactly where things be, be, begin and end. You know, as, as part of that wider review of what Marine Scotland is doing overall, is uh, aside from things like charging and our, our, and our, our targeting system, we are also looking at what we do around compliance, uh, with an aim to you know most people in 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 the marine area want to comply. Um, so what are we doing to help them comply? You know, there's, there's, there's one side of compliance, which is about identifying people who are, who are rogues or, or doing things wrong and making sure that we catch them and deal with them. But the other side of that is that when people want to comply, we have to be making it as easy for them to comply as yeah. possible. And it's, that's exactly the sort of area where I think we need to be more active. Uh, so it's not just about risk assessment and going after the, the bad guys. It's, it's helping the people who are trying to actually o obey the rules that, that they, they know are, are there. So we will continue to do anything we possibly can to, to, to get the technology that will make that easier. It will also make it easier to more, you know, more accurately refine where we have to actually protect, which in turn has is, is got advantages for the fishermen as well by, by making sure we're not closing off areas um, unnecessarily. Yeah, and I suppose on, the, on that note, um, obviously the... the, the main aim of an MPA is to protect a uh, species and I think a number of fishermen would recognise that, that they want to yeah. protect the seas for future generations. Um, how much consultation is there, maybe consultation is the wrong word, but how much discussion is there with fishermen in terms of helping uh, make sure that the boundary lines uh, are geographically sensible? So, uh, for example, I, I know that some who uh, get frustrated that there, it's unnecessarily um, large in places or unnecessarily small in places, and it doesn't fit with obvious geographical landmarks, yeah. which makes it easier for them to comply. So how much discussion is there with, in advance with those that are actually using the seas most? I, I imagine Michael will know more detail, but I, I do think we, we've got to accept that we're, we're, we've introduced MPAs. I think we've done a really good job, and got a, a, but that doesn't mean say we've got everything absolutely right or that we can't improve the process going forward. So, so th that sort of discussion is exactly what we what we do need. Is, is, is th there might well be very compelling scientific reasons why we have to do it in, the, in a particular way. But if there aren't, then we need to be, be, be flexible. But, but I, you, you, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> Yes, so in, in terms of, if, if we're talking about fishing, the, the thing that matters to fishermen is what the fisheries management measures are. So we'll put, uh, we'll put the MPA boundary yeah. aside. Um, so in terms of the management measures, I mean, we've gone through processes where we try to engage with fishermen who work in the area to try and understand how they, how they use the area. Um, but then you have to couple what they might see as being their optimal fishing grounds or fishing grounds that they might just use occasionally against what you're trying to achieve in terms of protecting the ecology of the area. And at some point you have to draw a line somewhere literally. Um, sometimes that works well for everyone because there's a natural <coughs> division between the activity and the, the, the habitat or species that you're trying to protect. And other times there is conflict because the activity is going too close or, or what have you, and you need to have some margin um, so that you can be certain that the, the protection is going to work. But we do try our best to, to get that balance um, right. And I think for most of the MPAs so far, we've actually done a fairly good job of striking that balance between the industry's needs and the, the needs of the environment. So in a word, you're content with compliance at the moment? I, I think we're generally content, but, but that doesn't mean to say in individual circumstances there, there will always be, be room for us to have, have 
you know, re, you know, look again at what what we've actually done. But we've, I wouldn't say we've, we've, you know, there are individual areas where I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's exactly what you've been hearing. But I think in the context of the overall MPA network, and, and we've got a large MPA network, you know, the, these seem to be more marginal. But there are bound to, you know, it's, it's a complex area, so there are bound to be areas where we can we can improve things, and, and we're always happy to look at that. Stevenson. Uh, firstly, my apologies for late arrival. I shall read uh, uh, the evidence that I was not present to hear uh, with great care. Um, you, I've just heard you, Mr Black, say you, do, you look to improve the process. Specifically in the context of Brexit, does that create particular opportunities for us to refine both process uh, and uh, definition? Uh, so that it might more closely uh, align with uh, Scotland's particular needs. Now, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm looking for a general question, not for detail at this stage. I, mean, I think the general position is that, that the, the government has been very clear that, that post-Brexit we're looking to enhance our environmental protection rather than, than, than see any diminution of it. Exactly how that might take place, uh, you know, we've also got our international obligations that we need to, to fit with as well. But, that, but that, the direction of travel is to make sure that we're, we're even better. Uh, than. Just to be clear, I wasn't m suggesting a move in either direction yeah. in case yeah. it were to be misunderstood. Yeah. Convener? Okay, thank you. Well, let's move this on. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener, and uh, I'd like to focus our minds on blue carbon uh, for um, a, a short while. And uh, just um, for the record, um, there's an SNH report, as, as the panel will know, um, which was published um, earlier this year, assessing blue carbon resources, which was a, a welcome step forward. Um, and that report suggested that there should be more research um, it was, however, um, very disappointing for those of us who had worked in the previous um, session on ensuring um, that blue carbon was part of the climate change plan, um, which, was, which was the previous one, um, including um, Minister Paul Wheelhouse, who was then um, uh, involved with that, and myself and, and a significant number of other people. Uh, it was very disappointing when it wasn't in the, um, in the present um, draft, although um, Cabinet Secretary Cunningham, as you will know, has um, uh, put on the record in a question to myself that there will be um, focus on it in the final plan, which is most welcome. Um, could you tell us in that context about how, how much money is set aside for research, or um, if you can write to us about that, if you can't tell us today, but um, what, what the research plans are to build on the SNH report and indeed the, the wider international report so that we can get into a place um, which we have developed very significantly in Scotland um, on peatlands, um, developing through to um, actual action and uh, saving the situation um, rather than simply being at the research stage. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I think Michael will want to say it, but I do agree with you that we do have to move quite quickly on, on this. Uh, and and uh, you know, I'm often speaking to my colleagues in Scottish Government about what we can do around climate change generally. Uh, and this is an area where, yes, you're right, we have to be doing research. But I, I also think that we have to be moving that forward to uh, thinking about what the actions are that is, mm. uh, around that as quickly as we can as well. Michael, you, you know more about the detail of the research. Yes, so we have been... Um developing a new um, research programme. It's a commitment in the programme for, for government to develop a, a programme. Yeah. Um, we are at the final stages of, of agreeing grants with a number of universities in Scotland. Um, in total, we will have one postdoctoral researcher um, and five PhDs going to be um, getting up and running in the next um, few months, looking at a, a range of topics. Um, so. Often blue carbon is associated with um, habitats such as kelp, meadow beds and so on. But actually, things like mud um, have absolutely massive stores. So there was a publication last year um, by St Andrews University which estimated that Loch Sooner on the west coast of Scotland has about 27 million tonnes of mud in it. Um, and pound for pound, it's storing five times as much per square kilometre is what peatland does. Yeah. So that resource is a fairly massive store. Um, and so to ensure that we can keep those stores 
and perhaps enhance them is, is definitely important in the context of, of climate change. Um, so, so the research programme is trying to understand better, quantify sediment storage um, across the marine environment. Um, there's one looking specifically at metal beds. Um, one will be looking at what happens to kelp. So kelp grows a bit like trees on land, but then it dies. How does that dead kelp then get assimilated into the seabed and how does that process work? Um, and also starting to look at how does our human activity um, affect the ability of habitats to store um, carbon. Um, in terms of value, that package is give or take £300,000. Um, and it's very much a starting point. You have to start somewhere. Um, we've got an, a very initial body of evidence. Um, and now it's taking that next step. Um, and once you've taken that next step, you can then decide, do you need to take a broader look um, at other research areas or do you carry on in depth um, on the themes that you're already studying? Um, so I think we've got a good package to start with. OK, so could we be um, hopeful that, uh, not in, in this final plan, of course, but I mean, that's helpful what you've outlined and encouraging, but for, for the next climate change plan, uh, whether it be at the end of this parliament or at the beginning of the next, that there will be um, something in the way of a progression towards action like there was with peatlands? I hope so. Um, but obviously, we don't know where the research will take us. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, the ambition is to get to a place where we're far more confident about the, the value of the marine environment um, uh, in terms of climate change mm -hmm. um, and carbon sequestration and so on. And um, possibly what necessary protections there might have to be. Yes. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I, if I could just add to that, I think the... There is no doubt at all about how important this is, uh, and therefore it is going to be, you know, we talked earlier on about prioritisation, and, and this high, is high priority, but we need to do some of the building blocks before we actually can, can turn it into practical action. But I would like to see us doing that very quickly. Thank you. I'm sure this is a subject we'll return to in the future. Can I just ask for a point of clarification? What is it you should do or shouldn't do to MUD to encourage it retains carbon or captures it? Or is that too complex a question at this stage? Well, that's something that we don't know. So I would imagine that the reason why sea lochs are, like lochs in it, are so muddy is it will be leaves that are coming off the trees. So it's actually an exchange from carbon sequestration on land and then being stored in the sea. Um, but we don't really know exactly. We know it happens, but we don't know exactly mm. how it happens or exactly whether we are affecting it or, or not. And that's what we'd like to to try and find out. OK, thank you. John Scott. I mean, this is all part of the, the geological uh, process. Uh, I mean, um, deposits of mud are, are the beginnings of sort of silts and grey wax and, you know, sedimentary rocks. It's, uh, so how far do, along that process do, do you look at, at carbon storage uh, in that regard? Uh, I mean, I appreciate it's absolutely fascinating, but where, where will you stop? You know, if you're starting to look at sedimentary deposits of, of mud, then do you start looking at deposits of calciferous rocks and things like that as well, which are obviously great storage areas? Um, I probably couldn't answer that, yeah. that question today, but I think the key for me as a policy practitioner, the answer I really want is how much sequestration is going on and what effect are we having on, on that potential? Mm -hmm. I think that, for me, in, in practical terms, that's the real answer, rather as what happened a million years ago or, or, or before. It's more about the here and now, but that's a very narrow policy, um, practical view of, of the world. My scientific colleagues would tell me that they need to know um, the past as well. OK, thank you. OK, okay. so <laughs> Finlay Carson. It's convenient. Uh, I welcome the fact that uh, you carry out a, a, a high level of uh, consultation and, and also, uh, Mr Black, you suggested that it would be very difficult to have a Scotland-wide rule, so it's obviously local decisions are important. And in that vein, can I, can I ask you about the, marine, uh, the National Marine Plan, which uh, seeks to engage with uh, uh, local stakeholders? Uh, can I ask if the funding for implement, uh, implementation of uh, those plans uh, is still being maintained at the 2016-2017 the 
2017 levels? As far as I'm aware, is I, I have to say in terms of the, the National Marine Plan, uh, I, I'm oddly proud of it, considering that I have nothing to do with it actually being introduced. But I think it is a, f a fantastic uh, um, uh, piece of work. I think currently it's being reviewed. We'll be reviewing it and then opening up consultation on what people think was perhaps missing or what, what, what we could improve on going forward. Um, that is certainly going to, going to be going ahead over the next few, few months, I think. Uh, and, and so we'll be looking to see what the next iteration of the National uh, uh, Marine Plan will actually look like. But um, so the resources will be there to do it. How quickly we can do it, I think, depends on how much. It's not so much a question of money, it's a question of, of the, the time of the individuals in, involved. It, is, it, it does require a huge amount of consultation in, in much the same way that, uh, that Michael was talking about earlier on. So it does take time. Uh, so there's no point in rushing it. We want to get it right. So it, 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 is, it is definitely on our, on our plans and, and you'll be seeing, I think, consultation about what people uh, are, see as, as the good points and the bad points of the, the marine plan over the next few months. Can you, can you give us any indication of timescales for the, the marine regions to be implemented? Mm. You, you. <laughs> um, so we have two marine planning partnerships currently. They are um, Shetland and Clyde. Um, Cabinet Secretary has already said that Orkney will be the next planning partnership and there are discussions ongoing between Marine Scotland, Orkney Islands Council and other potential partnership members. Um, other areas are starting to show an interest, um, but um, I guess Marine Scotland is not the only part um, of the, the public sector that's challenged resource-wise, so, so local authorities are becoming keener to do it, but they are similarly um, stretched in terms of resources, and it is quite an involved process to develop a, a, a regional plan. Um, so um, it really depends upon having willing partners for the partnership um, and resources to, to then actually take forward the planning processes. Okay. In, in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, there, there was an aim of achieving good environmental status by 2020. Um, putting aside the, the councils and the, the, the engagements you have, is the staffing levels within Marine Scotland uh, sufficient to, to achieve that aim? Um, so, good environmental status um, um, under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, um, we are taking that forward at, at a UK level. So, in 2012, we set out what the vision for good environmental status was. We've put in place the monitoring and assessment to measure that, um, and a programme of measures, um, which built on a mixture of existing measures and new ones that were coming um, on stream. Um, we're due to consult um, on the UK assessment in spring next year um, in terms of where we feel we are in terms of achieving good environmental status, um, with a view to that being submitted to the European Commission in October next year. So are you comfortable you've, you've got the, the resources and the staffing levels to, to do that? I think because it's a, a UK-wide effort, I think there's a pool of resources. It's like I um, mentioned the OSPAR process, which is international. A lot of the OSPAR intermediate assessment um, was about the, the, the countries that are also members of the EU working together to develop assessment methods that they can then apply nationally. So uh, a sizable chunk of the work was done through that process. Um, and the rest at the UK has been done in a sort of UK version of that with the four administrations working together to pool resources and effort to come up with the assessments required um, to, to measure good environmental status. Uh, I, mean, I, but I entirely understand your point. I, I, mean, I don't think we have any indication at the moment that we are running into trouble, but I suppose what we can give you a commitment is, is if that changes or, or there's anything that seems to, to put that at, at risk, then we will we'll, we'll certainly let you know and we can have a, a further discussion at that time. Okay. Thank you. Claudia Beavish. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Uh, you've already hinted at the challenges um, in relation to local authorities and resources. I wonder, obviously there's uh, so much knowledge within Marine Scotland itself, and I wonder the, the extent to which you have the resources uh, to do capacity building with local authorities and give them support and advice, or indeed you may well, of course, be doing 
a lot of that already, so it would be helpful if you could briefly um, outline what you're doing now and what you hope to do as we roll out to the nine um, other areas. I mean, we're certainly doing quite a lot of support, uh, and you're right, it is, it is quite intensive in terms of the amount of time and, and energy that, that has to go into it. And it also depends on the number of stakeholders and, and where their starting point is, because mm. some are already very well advanced and have a lot of, of, of knowledge that, that you're just building on at the, at the margins. Um, so we're, I, would, I would say that's one of the advantages to us, to having this phased roll out and actually be able to learn what we can from the, the, the early couple of partnerships to see how, how they go and what is actually required. At the moment, I would say I, I, would, I would like to see it going a, a bit quicker, but actually there's a bit of me that says, let's learn from the first couple before we start doing things much more widely than that. There's a lot of training involved. There's some very interesting uh, uh, training uh, environments. I don't know whether any of you have seen some of the big training um, um, plans and, and, and games that we actually go through in order to try and get people up to speed because it is a very complex area. I think one of the great advantages of what we're doing is that as stakeholders get involved in all this, they, they, they fully realise the complexity of, of the picture. They may well be coming to it from, from a good knowledge of their particular areas of expertise, but then it suddenly widens out that once you introduce everything from pipelines and uh, uh, shipping lanes and, and, and environmental impacts, that it's a much more complex picture, which I think actually helps the discussions going forward. So I would say we're, we're probably on track, but it's, it, it, may, it may appear slower than I, ideally you would like, but actually there are some advantages in taking it in, in a, a sensible pace. Is there anything you want to add to that? Thank you. Okay, just to conclude this session, I want to touch on offshore renewables. We just emerged from a protracted uh, issue around uh, a legal challenge to the consenting of four offshore wind farms in the first, the fourth and Tay. Uh, and whatever the, the rights and wrongs of the, the action that was taken by an NGO, there were concerns raised about the consenting process or, or aspects of it. I'm just wondering which, if any, of those concerns you took on board and what, if any, changes you've made to the consenting process learning the lessons of that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I was obviously very, very pleased at the, the outcome of the, the, the judicial review, which I think was, was the right one. Uh, I think our contending processes are, are um, very good, actually. I think they involve a lot of stakeholders. They give plenty of time for people to um, have input. Uh, what we need to make sure is that we have enough scientific um, support in our Marine Scotland science in order to, to be able to deal with some of the issues. And, and, and sometimes there, you know, scientists are going to disagree. Uh, all I can make, do is make sure that we have enough support in the uh, Marine Scotland science to deal with ornithological issues as well as any other issues that actually come up. So my, my main concern is to make, be, be make sure that we've got enough resources in the science and in the consenting process team. And we're looking to expand that team and to put some more resources into the science team to make sure that they're able to respond. We do see this next year as being quite an intensive year. There's a lot of activity going on. We need to gear up on, the, on what we're doing. All, you know, uh, Mr. Wheelhouse, Ms. Cunningham, you know, absolutely keen that we're actually in place to, to, to actually deal with that. So we're making sure we're in, even in this time of stretched resource, we are going to actually increase the resources we've got in this area because it is, uh, is, it, it's, a, it's a key area and it's a key time coming up ahead. But I, I don't think we've got any um, plans in place to, to fundamentally change the consenting process. Um, in the longer run, we may well want to do that. I think it's a question of our resources at the moment in terms of, of, uh, of looking at that in detail. Uh, given the large sums of money that are concerned in offshore yeah. renewables, is that one of the areas that you've been looking at your charging regime? That, that would seem to make sense, yes. I, I think that's right. And I think, you know, talking to industry, the feedback I, I've got is that they're you're, you're talking about huge amounts of money. So time is just a, a vital component to the economic validity of, of, of their plans. So if there are things that we can make sure that things go smoothly and quickly, that's fine. But at the same time, there is a limit to that because we do have to, you know, we've got a lot of stakeholders who are going to be interested and they have to have time to look at what's being planned as well and make sure that they've got the responses, whether it's our SPB or, or any other stakeholder. So we, there is a limitation as to how quickly we can go. It has to be as quick as we can do it, make sure that there's no bureaucratic, uh, you know, if like internal delays from our viewpoint that we deal with things quickly. But part of that, that process has to be making sure that everyone has a chance to have their say and, and put their, their, their point across. Okay, I think Mark Ross wants to come in briefly on that point. Just, 
In terms of building that collaborative approach that you have with other sectors, I mean, is there enough data sharing, for example, with the offshore wind industry, you as the, as the consenting body and, and NGOs? Um, I, th I think we have a very good relationship with, with the NGO. I, I know we had the, the JR, but I think you, you, if you take a step back, you'll see actually most of the NGOs have been very firmly behind mm -hmm. what we've been doing this. They recognise the, 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 the longer term benefits, understand you know, why RSPB had particular issues um, that, that we, we felt we had dealt with. But we actually have a really good relationship with the industry and with the NGOs and, and actually getting them all around the table is, is something that, that is, is easier in this area than it is in some other areas we, we deal with. So I think there's quite a lot of collaboration. Data sharing, I haven't heard any, any requests to change the position at the moment. Uh, we just need data uh, as quickly as we can, as early as we can, and we need to be able to share that so that people can understand what the impacts are. So uh, if, you, if you've heard of, of, of concerns yourself, then we'd be very interested to hear about it. But uh, I, I had a, me a meeting in Aberdeen where we had representatives from all the industry uh, uh, there, and it, and it certainly didn't come out at that stage, nor has it in, in any of my discussions with, with in, in NGOs in bilaterals. OK, well, uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. I think that's been useful. You've undertaken to come back to us with a variety of pieces of information. We would appreciate that as quickly as it's humanly possible. Could I just, uh, just one tiny little point going, going forward? There aren't many questions on that, but I did want to raise the fact that we're marine litter is one of the areas where um, we are very, you know, you'll have seen it's in the programme for government, uh, and we are very keen that we, we move forward on that quickly. Uh, you know, we've got to the stage now where everyone knows it's bad. It's the question of now getting down to the practicalities of how we might deal with that. Some of those are, are simply marine issues. Some of them are, are wider. But we, in terms of, of our priorities, that, again, is one of the priorities that hadn't come up in the conversation today. Okay. But I just thought I should let you know that that's, that's very high on our agenda. OK. And, and again, feel free in future to write to us and update us as that, that moves forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the time. I'm going to spend briefly for the changeover of the witness panel. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back um, to the committee meeting. We will now continue the scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19 with evidence from Scotland's Rural College. Can I welcome Wayne Powell, the Principal and Chief Executive, um, Gavin McGregor, Jamie Newbold and Mike Winberg. Um, can I kick this off, gentlemen, by looking at the Scottish Government's research budget and the fact that it's fallen over recent years. Uh, I'm wondering how your funding for education research and advisory and consultancy work has changed in recent years and how that reflects the workload that's sat alongside it. So, um, one of the key unique selling points about the Scotland's Rural College is the fact that we have an integrated model. So we incorporate both uh, our research, our education, and our consultancy business uh, with one operation. So in some ways, that gives a degree of resilience in terms of our funding. However, it also um, does put a lot of pressure on us in being able to deliver. If we take the main subject of today's uh, focus, and that is the resource budget, in the last year, we received a £200,000 uh, reduction, which um, impacted particularly our rural policy centre and our work with long-term biological programmes, the, the Long Hill Dairy Herd. So in some ways, the, the, uh, the, the, the reduction in the budgets um, impact our research, but it's really important when we consider any future funding profile that we look at this strategically and holistically across the spectrum of of, of our research activities. I'm not sure if Mike wants to come in specifically on consulting or Jamie to add more to the education um, uh, budget. I could perhaps just mention that um, the, uh, we provide veterinary services, the disease surveillance program for Scotland, and uh, that in that area we took, um, it, it's going back now for three or four years, we took quite a big hit on our budget there. It's about a 10% cut in real terms. Um, and that, that has led us to have to reconsider our activities, how we structure them, et cetera, and that did lead then to the consultation, which perhaps people are aware of, in 2015, uh, where we reviewed our services and how we went about doing those, and we've since come to quite different conclusions, actually, in how we take those forward. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll, we'll return to those in due course. Um, can I ask about the way in which you're funded by the Scottish Government? I'm thinking about single-year budgets, that type of thing. What difficulties, if any, that creates? And where it leaves you in, in general as an organisation in terms of a sustainable uh, financial footing? So our, our total funding from the Scottish Government is £41.4 million against a total income of approximately 76 million and we receive 7.4 million from the resource budget and that represents 42 percent of our total research budget so those are the the, the overall proportions of funding um, that that um, uh, we receive from from scottish government and in terms of where that leaves you or where you are currently uh, in as regards to sustainable financial footing how, how does it look? So currently um, we are financially, financially sustainable. Uh, this year we'll make a modest surplus of about 1.3 million, which represents 1.3% or excuse me, we, we'll um, uh, generate a modest surplus of around 900,000, which is about 1.3% of our total income. The key question is future sustainability and long-term sustainability, and doing nothing is not an option. So really, this is why we put in place a fairly ambitious and robust strategy to be able to ensure that we are sustainable and also to meet the future needs of Scotland during a period of major change. And uh, I want to emphasise the, 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 the significance of this change and the impact of that change is significant. So we're not complicit complacent. We've certainly put in place a robust strategy and we're working now to deliver that strategy, including our infrastructure plans and our business planning to support that. And on the subject of change, uh, David uh, Stewart, some questions around the impact of Brexit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, some questions around um, Brexit. Um, clearly, currently, your EU networks are absolutely crucial for knowledge exchange. What assessment have you made about will these networks continue post-Brexit? So Brexit has a, a significant impact at a number of different levels, and uh, these are, uh, and they are interrelated and interconnected. Uh, the first uh, consequence of Brexit is our ability to attract and retain talent. 
Right. Second is uh, our ability to access research funding on, on the networks that you referred to. And third, of course, the students. So mm -hmm. those three areas are of paramount importance and they are impact and will impact our capacity to deliver excellence on a reputational uh, on a reputation. So those are really big, big issues. Um, in terms of, of uh, a, the broader picture, again, Brexit has, has got major implications for agriculture and livestock in particular, which is one of our core unique selling points. So there's major concern around those areas. In terms of mitigating uh, those, those challenges, we're putting in place a number of steps. One of them is, is, is doubling our effort in terms of collaboration and partnership, and also maintaining our strong relationships globally and within Europe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jamie was recently at a uh, University of Scotland event, and you may want to expand in terms of the, the uh, further feedback from that. Yeah, I mean, just uh, in terms of the quantification, uh, the, the, the total funding is about uh, 350k through Horizon 2020 per year for us. Uh, clearly, if we lose that, that will be significant. There are opportunities, and we're driving them forward in terms of the uh, Global Challenges Research Fund, our, our opportunities uh, to create networks outside Europe using the experience we've gained of uh, European networks. And, and that's something we'll actively uh, drive forward. We're also working with partners to ensure that the uh, knowledge transfer, the information mm. into Europe will continue. Uh, so with uh, some of the agri-tech centres that we're engaged with, we're now looking to engage with some of the major European networks in a new mechanism that will allow us to continue uh, to access and influence that even after Brexit. And, and what percentage of your staff are currently from our EU citizens, not from the UK? So we have, we have uh, 192 staff, which are from mainland Europe. And Gavin, as a proportion, you may want to expand on that. Yeah, we have um, 151 that are um, EU non-UK, and uh, we have five, uh, 41 further afield. So it's predominantly research-based, actually. There's a heavy right. rating of those staff because of the nature of the work that they do that are mm -hmm. international. Right. And clearly, um, I think we're all struggling to find out the detail about Brexit. And as you would have heard from the early session, we've just returned from Brussels and to some discussions with other countries around this issue. I mean, have you um, effectively got a risk committee that uh, looks at the possible effect of Brexit and that feeds into what your future strategy will be? Most certainly, we have a, a paper that goes to the board uh, for each session, which outlines um, uh, the various scenarios with respect to Brexit. We have an internal working group that looks at Brexit. Uh, our colleagues have contributed to a recent AHDB horizon scanning and the impact of, of, uh, of Brexit on, on Scotland and Scotland farming in particular. So we do take it very seriously and we are proactive in terms of managing that risk with our board and, uh, and are working uh, diligently as well to be able to influence many of these issues at uh, both the University of Scotland and also um, with our various external roles as well. And my final question is, um, in general terms, have you picked up anxiety from your non-UK non EU citizens that you employ? Well, of course, before taking up this, uh, this role, I was living in Montpellier in France. So, uh, yes, I think there was a, a degree of shock. And, of course, I think the other part around this is that um, there is the issue of culture and the relationships you develop in research. And these have been developed over, I suppose, our generation and more. And therefore, uh, a fracture of those relationships will uh, cause a chilling, which I think is, is, is potentially problematic. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Uh, Mark Roscoe. That's, that's very clear. Um, thank you. Can I just actually just pick up briefly on, on that last point? What, what, what actual programmes have you, have you lost collaborations with other European partners as a result of Brexit? Um, I can just remember going to your stall at the Royal Hand Show last year, the day after the referendum. There was already concern at that point that some potential projects were now not possible. So it would be interesting to know exactly practically what these projects are. I think we can um, uh, submit to you more details on this issue. What I'd like to point out, I guess, is that um, we are relatively new into this role. I've been in, in post 16 months. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamie's been in post um, three months. Um, but, uh, Jamie, do you want to expand on that point to, to give uh, examples? And if we sure. can't, we'll come back mm -hmm. to you. Okay. So w what initially happened uh, was that we saw resistance from uh, colleagues, particularly where we were going to uh, coordinate activities. Uh, I think some of the announcements about the continuation of funding for bids that have entered in have been very useful, uh, and that has dropped off. 
Um, where the challenge now is, as the next framework builds, is how we engage in those discussions uh, going forward with the degree of uncertainty about our engagement. Uh, to that extent, uh, we've been engaging with the University of Scotland group uh, on Brexit. We met with Lord Duncan uh, earlier last week uh, and trying to get clarity on whether uh, we will be able to engage in the next framework uh, going forward is probably on that side our biggest challenge. Okay. Can I just move on to the, 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 the practical benefits that your projects and research, research delivers in communities across Scotland and what the benefits are for the economy and the environment? Can you flesh out in more detail what the practical benefits have been of your research programme? OK, just to, to, to give a few examples of the, the kind of things. Uh, so we've been working in the area of uh, antimicrobial resistance, helminthic resistance, which is a major problem. Uh, so some of the joint work we've been doing uh, up in Kirkton uh, with the Morden on developing more refined methods of antimicrobial worm treatment uh, of sheep have both made enormous economic benefits because less labour, less cost is going in, but actually significant environmental benefits in terms of lowering the resistance. Uh, on a more forward-looking, uh, my, my colleagues are working on, on TB, which, as you know, is a major and upcoming challenge to the dairy sector. Uh, and uh, they've been able to identify uh, regions of the genome that give resistance to TB. And actually, for the first time now this year, they've introduced uh, breeding values into the, the dairy industry for TB-resistant cattle. So those would be two examples uh, among maybe many. And uh, if it's useful, I can send in some documentation. Yeah. I think that, I think that, that would be useful. I'm fairly... We, we have fairly uh, comprehensive uh, information on the economic impact of our contribution to, uh, to Scotland and the UK economy. As Jamie has just outlined, um, uh, the emphasis on livestock is, is very impressive. The Lang Hill Dairy Herd, which is based in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, contributes something like £408 million to the economy. Um, and we have other examples as well where um, our work is, is, is contributing not only economically but socially. So we have the economic uh, metrics of performance, but we also have, through our research excellence framework in 2014, 10 case studies which were peer-reviewed peer -reviewed and demonstrated the impact and social impact of our work uh, uh, within, within Scotland and beyond. Yeah. And can I just pick up two um, uh, particular funds and, and areas of collaboration? Um, you mentioned in your written submission about the uh, Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund. But I notice there's only been one project that's come through that. Now, are there issues there in terms of changing budget for KTIF? Um, and, uh, you know, how that relates to the voluntary model? Because, you know, we have a voluntary model in Scotland, working with farmers, collaboration, knowledge transfer, that's obviously important. And just related to that, another um, collaboration you're involved in, the Innovation Support Service. Uh, which I gather is a, a collaboration with the Soil Association. Again, that's about work, you know, on, on flood management, um, catchment scale work. But that's only there's only money there for research and development, not for capital funding. So I don't know if you have thoughts on on. So I'll turn of those to I, 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 I'll turn to Mike Weinberg um, specifically on this point. But I think the Innovation Fund is being led by the Soil Association, and we are subcontractors. Yes, they're, they're uh, both the both examples that you quoted are actually very new. Um, the uh, the live lambs project uh, is only just uh, just being kicked off, so the, it's early days with that. It's it's a good example of a collaborative project with benefits up and down, both from the farmer right up through the processing sector and so on. So a real supply chain project. Mm -hmm. So you've got that on the one hand. The innovation support service uh, again is only just kicked off. Uh, we've got the, the lead on that is Soil Association. We'll be supporting that, but that is all really about taking uh, uh, the, the innovation that's come through our research programs and others, because uh, we're working in collaboration with a r range of other partners, including others from Safari, uh, then to, uh, to take those to the, to the coalface. But it's, it's too early, really, to be able to give you any concrete examples of where we've, we've done that. This is literally, I think, it kicked off in September. Yeah. Is, is the budget adequate? These, these types of collaborative uh, funds and workings? 
I think uh, w w what I'd say is the we've grabbed the opportunities that have been there, and you know th these are s two specific examples that you're asking about amongst a whole range of collaborative projects that we have on the go. Um, and probably our approach is to look across the spectrum of opportunities that there are, not just specifically at these ones. We have submitted more applications to KTIF, uh, for example, some of which haven't been approved, but th that's the one that you quote is the one that has been. I just had 408 million as the value of the Langham had. Is that over the 45 years of the herd, or is that every year currently? I suspect the former. It is, it's a, correct, it is the former. Over the period that has been, been initiated, which is a 40-year period. However, um, as we look forward, the long-term data that is embedded in that study particularly with respect to the uh, opportunities from big data and some of the disruptive technologies, we anticipate that to be of even greater significance. You, but you're quite correct, that's not on an annual basis, it's on a, on a cumulative basis. But, but nonetheless, it's something, if you don't have it today, you can't buy it because you can't go back 45 years. So therefore, the prospective value going forward of the Langham herd is almost impossible to quantify because that's going to be presumably uh, where you're going to be able to test future medicines and so on and so forth against the genomes and the evolution of the genomes that come from the Langham herb. So, so therefore, this is probably one of your greatest assets. Is that, am I over-egging the pudding or am I getting it spoiled? No, not at all. I think it's, uh, it's actually very helpful. I think... Um, what, uh, let me use a couple of terms to help uh, flesh this out. I think it's uh, what some people would call part of a national capability. Mm. I think it's more like a crown jewel. I think it's a really important resource. And as we move forward, the capacity to interrogate that, that information will be uh, not only, uh, it will be a distinctive uh, element of a future research strategy and particularly important when we have to balance both the productivity agenda with the resilience and the environmental sustainability. So really, really important resource. Moving on, Richard Lyle. Yeah, to my uh, questions, can I ask you something about your um, financial statement um, and report for 31st of March 2016? Um, am I right? correct in saying you had a loss on disposal of fixed assets and also that you had a loss in regard to pension schemes in 2015 by an actual gain in 2016. Would you like to pick that up, Gavin? Um, picking up the pensions one, yeah, you are right. There has been a significant adverse swing in the last year. I think it's updated when we get uh, valuations updated. So last year there was a pension deficit charge against accounts of just under 12 million. So you're correct, there was a significant... 12 million? 12 million, 11.8 million, yeah. Okay. So where are we now with pension? Have we secured the, the you know, it's a concern for people who have uh, gone to pensions and how, how much the pension pot has been dil diluted. Um, so where are we now? Well, we, we do have a, a number of risks as an organisation. We have seven pension funds. Um, what we've agreed to do is a strategic review of the whole pension risk. Um, a number of the pension schemes at the end of this year give their updated triennial valuation. So on the back of that, we will look at our whole pensions profile and risks. But it is a legacy issue from obviously dating back to the merger. We've got a complex pension position. And it, what you can see in the accounts is significant uh, financial swings that arise from that. So some companies have changed how their pension uh, finishes up. How is yours? Just if the convener will allow me to ask that question, because I think it's quite interesting. Twelve million pound loss. Well, it's a valuation swing, uh, valuation. which is yeah, yeah. it's uh, represented in the counts. But eleven point eight million last year was a significant swing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that one for another day, I suppose. Um, we've the Scottish government funds research under a number of headings: centres for expertise, innovation funds, innovation support service, underpinning capacity safari contract research funding. Over all these themes, there's also a need to review the direction of research and balance of funding on an ongoing basis. In your view, is the current combination of types of research funding the most efficient way to meet the Scottish Government's objectives? I think that um, I'll make a start on this and I'll turn to some of my colleagues. I think it's really important to uh, appreciate and understand 
um, that what we have currently is um, a distribution of funding which was designed a couple of years ago. What we will now face going forward is profound set of challenges. And I think as we look forward, I think it's going to be really important that we understand future needs. That's because the nature of the research, and that is, the, uh, that is because also of the long-term nature of what we do. And therefore, if we look at the balance of funding going forward, I think we need to focus on, on a couple of areas. One is that we really need to understand the future needs of Scottish Government and really need to understand that in the light of Brexit and the light of, of, of different drivers. Second, I think we need to be focusing in, uh, within each of our institutions on those areas of strength and those areas of excellence that can really make a, a significant contribution at pace. I th third, we need to be looking at our in levels and types of collaboration and having much more intensive and sophisticated levels of collaboration in order to be able to move these areas forward. So um, the answer to your question is that we need to be reviewing that balance of funding and balance of investment in the light of the new strategic drivers going forward. In our case, I think it's going to be particularly important that uh, we consider um, the future role of hill farming and the role of ruminant agriculture in the future. So these are going to be really important areas that we need to consider, and therefore the future strategic direction that this uh, research programme takes is going to be of critical importance. Yeah, um, thanks for that. How do you view the balance between policy relevant and strategic research funding provided by the Scottish Government? I think that the, the, uh, the policy relevance of the programme is absolutely critical. And I think the design of these programmes and the core design of these programmes is, is critical. Because I think the Scottish Government is going to require the best scientific evidence in order to implement policy. So the relationship between evidence and policy is critical. Clearly, as we look forward, some of those policy imperatives are likely to change. And that is where we now need to be focusing our attention. Uh, sorry, just to finish off, Mr McGregor, you skipped over and didn't answer my question in regard to the loss on disposal of fixed assets. Why was that and what was it? Uh, sorry, I don't have the details for that, but we can supply that for you. Thank you. Right back to us. I think there's two colleagues who want to come in here, Stuart Stevenson followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, I just wanted a wee clarification, uh, probably from Mr McGregor on pensions. Uh, the £12 million, that's an actuarial... Is, is that a reduction in the cash value of the investments in the fund? Or is it an actuary, a change in the actuarial estimate of the future liabilities? Uh, my understanding is it does relate to the liabilities, so it's uh, in line with the FRS yeah. accounting standards. Yeah. It is a, a, an accounting adjustment on that basis. Right. So, so, so therefore, uh, the the effects are some some point in the future, yeah. albeit given the long-term nature of pension funds, they need to be considered now. The, the current payouts to pensioners and immediate ones in prospect are not affected by this in any way. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Mr Cameron. I'm, I'm sorry, <coughs> sorry to press the point of uh, Richard Lyles, but um, on the loss and disposal of fixed assets, we are seeing a change from 2015 from 253, a loss of 250,000 odd to 3 million of the course of a year. That is a huge chunk out of your surplus, with respect. And I'm surprised that no one here can speak to that loss. <coughs> Do you have any? Uh... I don't know the specific details of the, the breakdown from the accounts. I mean, obviously, since the merger point in 2012, I think there's been about 10.5 million of property sales over that period. But there's also been flux, and there's been a, about just under 8 million <coughs> invested. So, in terms of your question about the, the, the accounts and the change of the financial value, I would need to get the details for that specific. We would want to see those details in writing. You ensure right. this is with you uh, promptly. OK, thank you, uh, Mr Powell. Uh, moving on, uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina, and good morning to the panel. Um, I want to turn our minds to um, 
SRUC and the National Performance Framework. And um, Mr. Powell, you've already highlighted the importance of policy being evidence-based. Um, as, as you'll all know, Scotland performs measures and reports on the progress of government in Scotland, and Scotland can be judged against a wide range of indicators as set out in the National Performance Framework. There are the national outcomes and the national indicators, and as you um, uh, may well know, but for the record, these are being reviewed at, um, at present, and I'm, I'm involved with, with that review. Um, could I ask um, how the research that you carry out um, can help to deliver against Scot the Scottish Government's national outcomes and uh, national indicators in the National Performance Framework and what um, involvement um, you or others within um, the organisation have had? Well, I think the first point is that the Strategic Research Programme is framed and designed to deliver against Scottish Government's uh, economic strategy and National Performance Framework. So, um, and I think we have excellent evidence of return on, on this investment. Currently, if we look at um, uh, our involvement in the SRP, we deliver against six um, of those uh, uh, national outcomes, and they include, for example, um, our work on uh, uh, bovine viral disease, which contributes to Scot Scotland's uh, economic potential, uh, which is uh, national indicator number two. It al we also contribute to number six, healthier lives, where human health may be affected by animal diseases, including E. coli and Campylobacter. So we contribute to at least of the six of those national outcomes, as, uh, as described in the, in the performance framework. Right, thank you, that's helpful. I, I just draw your attention to a comment by um, this food, the Food Agency Scotland, which considers the research programme to make a valuable contribution to the delivery of um, national outcomes and Scotland's reputation for research and innovation. But they do comment, and I quote, there is a need to properly align the work of the strategic policy relating to food protection and public health. And it is also of the view that FSS, FSS and the, the SR should place greater focus on applied research which is able to demonstrate clear policy application and is sufficiently flexible to adapt to changing priorities. Now, we've already had a discussion about this this morning um, and you have highlighted some points, but uh, this is the, the view of one, one of the uh, you know, statutory bodies, but I wonder if you have any comment on that particular aspect of it. Certainly, I think that... Um the, a need, the need to be agile and flexible is an issue. And I think greater agility and flexibility in terms of what uh, we are able to do in the support of these changing policy frameworks is going to be really important. I also think the, the, uh, the connectivity between agriculture and the consumer and food safety is an important area and will grow in significance as we go forward. So I think we do contribute to the National Performance Framework. Uh, um, but we also need to be agile in terms of being able to address future priorities as they emerge, and you've just illustrated one of them. Right, thank you. And could you um, identify any other ways in which um, you might be able to increase your contribution to the Scottish Government's national um, objectives um, in the framework? I think there are uh, major opportunities for us to, uh, to contribute to economic growth, and I think contributing to economic growth through uh, greater uh, uh, commercial income and also through the development of spin-out companies. And this is something that uh, we're currently working on with uh, uh, the Royal Bank eSpark Entrepreneurial Programme, where we certainly want to be encouraging our students and staff to be generating uh, spin-outs, also the opportunities for generating intellectual property. I think these are areas where I think we can, we can make a contribution. I think the other area I think that um, uh, in our forward strategy is that we want to, want to grow a regional presence and view a regional presence in terms of being an anchor institution to support local economies. Right, thank you. And, and um, I, I very much hope that it's sustainable economic growth that you're referring to rather than economic growth, just to highlight that. I, I would be arguing for sustainable development, but that's just a personal view. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what it means, it appears, anyway. So. Uh, Finlay Carson. I can ask, uh, what discussions have you had with the Scottish Government with regards to uh, a future agricultural support system that uh, will have to come into place after Brexit within the, the UK framework? Mike, would you like to take that up? 
The discussions that we've had thus far have uh, none have really been formal discussions. We've had informal discussions with a variety of uh, government officials about um, their ideas on how things may be taken forward. I think it's fair to say that <clears throat> every time the, the word Brexit comes up in the changing landscape, everybody talks about the lack of clarity, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, uh, so, so to some extent, the discussions that we then end up, we take that as a given, and, and we all have views then about what the challenges and reality will be. And, and I think even on that basis, find quite a lot of common ground in terms of the really practical things that are going to need to be tackled. Um, but in, in, as far as detail uh, and formal discussions, really nothing. I think that um, where we've had considerable input is through a rural policy centre. And the Rural Policy Centre provides the Secretariat for a cross-party group focusing on the rural economy. And that is uh, an area where I think we have our extensive conversations, discussions. Uh, a number of position papers are being, being drafted, uh, which uh, really presents uh, uh, perhaps the horizon scanning and options. Uh, and uh, certainly this is an area through our agricultural economists and policy uh, group where we have been having conversations. And I think we have an important role to play. Okay, thank you. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Good morning uh, to, to the panel. Uh, if I could turn to uh, future research challenges. Um, you, you've said in your written submission that you face what you call the perfect storm uh, of demographics, food security, climate change, non-renewable resource exhaustion, malnutrition, reduced biodiversity, etc. So, in, in essence, uh, the challenges are large, long-term, complex, but central to continued social and economic progress. So, uh, as a result of these uh, those challenges, um, does the way the Scottish Government fund research uh, need to change in order to deal with the research challenges that uh, that lie ahead? And if so, how? So, um, the Scottish the Scottish Government funding to date has uh, been uh, important because it's allowed two or three things to happen, which are important, uh, which are relevant to your question. The first is that it's supported interdisciplinary research. Uh, and the complex challenges we face at the moment will not be addressed by a simple reductionist approach. So I think the work, the, Scottish, the funding the Scottish Government has provided in supporting that interdisciplinary research is really important. The second is that it's supported inter-institutional work, which again is an important element. I think the third area that it's supported is um, uh, the capacity to, ve to develop teams of individuals to work together to be able to tackle these long-term, often called wicked challenges. And the last point is, is, is the importance and significance of supporting uh, long-term mission-driven research together with biological resources and long-term data sets, which are going to be critical as, as, we, as we go forward. In addition to that, I think um, the interface of uh, life sciences and social sciences are going to be really important. All of those elements, actually, that, is, that, that, that are funded to the Scottish Government are really, really important. If we look forward, I think we are going to have to intensify the extent and way in which we collaborate. And that is a really, really important area that, that um, uh, we are focusing at the moment. We've recently announced a strategic alliance with the Morden Institute, and that is designed to address these uh, complex questions that you refer to, uh, certainly by co-locating facilities, looking at shared facilities, maximizing the use of resources, and really taking a much more joined up approach to be able to tackle these areas uh, going forward. I suppose the other area that is going to be critical as we, as we tackle these areas going forward is the area of innovation. And SIUC is very well placed uh, given the connection between research and translation and overcoming this, this valley of death that, are, that, that, that is often referred to. So those are areas that, um, that, we, that, there, that, that, there is, that there is strength. However, there's also areas where we need to be looking to intensify the nature of the collaboration and also um, create the headspace for innovation. Okay, thanks. Um, in your submission, you also state that um, th there'll be the requirement for longer term uh, research, which, which you've mentioned in your, your previous answer. Um, and, and what areas do you think that uh, longer term research um, 
is needed. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, the, the challenges that, are, that we face with uh, hill farming, um, significant challenges. Uh, would that be one of them? And, and can you give examples of any others? Well, if one looks at, uh, um, first of all, my plea would be uh, to ensure that we're strategic about this and we look across the whole programme. Um, we are doing this within SIUC. Um, from an SIUC perspective, I think the, the, one of the area of focus for the future is going to be on integration of pastoral and ruminant agriculture, potentially with agroforestry. So this is an area that is going to be really critical to address uh, um, some of the challenges we'll fo face in a post-Brexit world. I think um, uh, over 50% of Scotland's agriculture is dependent on livestock. Much of our livestock is managed on, on land which is uh, uh, environmentally fragile. And therefore, this whole focus on this area, I think, is going to be of critical importance in the future. And we would certainly wish to shift some of our emphasis into that area in order to be able to address that uh, going forward. Would you like to add to that, Jamie? Yeah, I think that area, the additional area is, of course, uh, climate change is with us. There are going to be very real challenges in terms of biosecurity. Again, as Wayne mentioned, you know, that's part of the driver through the collaboration uh, with the Morden to bring together our expertise in terms of biosecurity, both for animals and for plants, because that will be a challenge. So these are areas that I think we would like to focus on, the whole pasture based system and the whole area of biosecurity. And again then, you know, how do you bring the disruptive technologies in? Uh, you know, we're going to have to boost the productivity of that grassland dramatically. <coughs> but there are real developments in smart agriculture, smart fencing, etc. Real de developments in terms of genetics that can do this. So the time is right to take these challenges scientifically, but also because that's where the needs are. OK, thank you. Well, um, on the subject of the collaboration with the more than uh, John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener, uh, and good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to this committee. Um, can I just say, I have to declare an interest as an honorary fellow of the Morden, um, but how much I welcome this uh, collaborative venture between you and the Morden, because I believe that the, the working together, the total will indeed be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, can you... Um, tell us uh, of the benefits of this likely collaboration, um, the type of work this new collaboration will enable or enhance, and how will it be funded, please? So I think um, the, the collaboration between SIUC and Morden is specifically designed to uh, bring a step change in our approach to supporting livestock and livestock uh, farming in Scotland during a period when there was going to be pressure on, uh, on uh, many areas, including uh, disease. So one area that, uh, of immediate action is that we plan to relocate our central laboratory from uh, uh, its current location onto the modern site so that we will be sharing facilities and infrastructure and equipment and therefore creating the synergies and interactions between uh, researchers and scientists in that specific area. I'll leave Mike um, uh, come in and elaborate a little bit more on the, on the finances around that. So that's one immediate step which we intend to, which we intend to, to action uh, in 2018. The second is that we plan as well to uh, look at the establishment of, of uh, interdisciplinary research centres, which uh, uh, includes areas that, that Jamie referred to, that is biosecurity. How can we look at, a, at, at an approach to biosecurity that brings the expertise, including some of the new digital technology that's available to create 21st century surveillance uh, methodology? Uh, and finally, I think there are strong opportunities for us to be looking at um, the way in which we engage uh, with knowledge exchange or knowledge transfer by bringing together the expertise that we have across both organisations in a synergistic manner. So those are the high-level uh, uh, indicators. In terms of funding this going forward, I will leave uh, um, uh, uh, Mike to, to comment, but uh, for our board meeting in December, we'll be putting forward a proposal um, that will involve uh, um, support, capital investment to support this initiative. Thank you. So I'll just comment then on, uh, so firstly, just to say that from uh, the point of view of our, um, all of our veterinary operations, um, I related earlier to the uh, consultation that we had in 2015 and then a s significant review of really everything that we're doing. Um, the plan then is that 
our central laboratory operations at the Bush estate uh, has actually been a constraint to the way that we uh, do business in that the facilities are old, dated, and uh, to the point that we've actually had to close part of them and lease at additional cost premises from the University of Edinburgh. So the fact that we've now got an, uh, a facility that we can move into which will provide uh, sufficient space, we actually see as a growth opportunity effectively for that part of the business. We'll concentrate uh, uh, equipment, expertise and so on into that facility. Um, and so to a significant extent, the, the, uh, the funding for that, there's a, there's a small capital requirement. A lot of the facilities are actually right up to the mark right now. They'll need to be adapted for what we put in there. There's a small capital cost associated with that, for about a million pounds. And um, the rest of it will be funded from operations as we go forward. We see that there's the significant growth opportunities as we go forward in this type of work. And the other thing that we'll be doing is working with the Morden to share some of the operations that, uh, where they, we don't have to duplicate. So if there are particular functions where we can share, we'll be looking to do exactly that. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I know from speaking to uh, Professor Julie Fitzpatrick that she's optimistic about um, healthier animals being able to um, provide carbon reduction, which is something that we're very interested in as a committee. Would you like to expand on that a little? Yeah, so there are, there are real options. You know, I think there are figures that if we can get the worst 25% of farmers to farm as well as the average, will reduce carbon emissions by about a, a quarter. So, you know, getting animal health uh, under control mm -hmm. is important. But there are also real progression in terms of breeding for low-carbon animals. Uh, real insights coming through from some of the uh, research research, uh, research programme that suggests that it is actually a breedable trait. We can breed for low-carbon animals. Simultaneously, as we move towards a more pasture-based system, we can also work on the grass genome in terms of uh, grass breeding. And I think there are real opportunities to significantly reduce the emissions from uh, ruminant agriculture, such that the carbon sequestration that we also know happens in the soil can balance it. Absolutely. Could I just um, have a, a brief follow-up to that question um, from my colleague John Scott and ask you about soil in relation to um, carbon, please, and what research is ongoing or what you're hoping to do in the future on that? So we have a, a carbon management uh, centre within SIUC who uh, uh, my colleague Bob Rees works uh, with others uh, on that and we have an active programme of soil carbon measurement uh, but also trying to understand how different production systems and different cropping systems can increase uh, carbon balance and trying to get a holistic view to the emissions where you know there are clearly emissions from the livestock but there are opportunities for significant sequestering in the soil so it remains and will remain a very active role for us that's very reassuring as as it's one of the agriculture as, and land uses we know uh, are one of the heaviest um, emitters yes. yeah and if i can follow up if i may convene and that is um uh, to take a development approach, of course, the whole area of intercropping is really important and moving away from monoculture and certainly the role of legumes in, in, in agriculture is an, is an area where Scotland, I think, again, needs to take a fresh look. So those are areas where we're active and we would like to focus more in the future in terms of carbon sequestration and, 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 and balancing um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, and mitigating against some of the greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just a quickie, are you also doing research in the bacteria in the gut, which plays a key role in the conversion of food to nutrition for the animal, but more fundamentally in this uh, methane for the atmosphere? Well, this is uh, Jamie Noble's area of expertise in terms of rumen metagenomics, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Jamie. I'll try not to bore on it. Uh, yeah, two major, two major approaches. Uh, one, uh, based around the animal uh, genetics, so we now understand that the host controls the, the bacteria in the gut, and yeah. that's how the methane emissions occur, yeah. but also real progression on f additives that can reduce. There are now yeah. additives that are available that will reduce emissions from cattle by 50%. Uh, there are real possibilities of uh, making major emissions. I think the challenge now, just to come back to your colleagues mentioned, these need to be brought within a holistic system so we can balance them through. So the reductionist studies are done. I think it's the systems level studies. It's the barriers to the economic uptake of these by farmers. So it comes back to what Wayne was saying, that need for transdisciplinary research to make sure that technical uh, solutions become practical. Thank you. Finley Carson. 
I mean, all this stuff is it's, it's good to hear. Um, there's there's uh, many people have voiced concerns that uh, two sectors in particular, uh, when it comes to the, the, the draft climate change, um, don't go far enough, and that's transport and agriculture. Can you uh, give us an idea why you think that uh, the, the government haven't been more ambitious with regards to reducing uh, emissions from agriculture? Is that because you haven't fed into that process to, to, to look at the, the possibilities? Um, because it, you know, there's many people think uh, agriculture should be more ambitious in reducing uh, their emissions. Jamie. Yeah, so having come in uh, recently, I would say the major challenge has been getting farmers to accept and integrate technologies and actually understanding as a researcher what is practical within farms. I think, again, coming back to the point, this transdisciplinary research where we work through uh, to the farmers through my company's consultants gives us a real opportunity to make a difference. As I say, there are technical solutions. It's understanding and then pulling the policy levers to make sure those things happen. So um, I think it's that lack of connection of the technical solution with the farmer base that has been the issue. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I've come here is I believe SIUC has the mechanisms to do that. I think a real difference can and actually should be made. I think the other part of that may well be actually is quantifying many of these areas and therefore the quantification of this is difficult and I, I think access to, to uh, new data uh, approaches uh, and some of the transparency around that is also going to be a major shift going forward. Uh, Mark Drosko. To expand that then, I mean, where, where's the gap in terms of delivery? There's always fantastic research going on. Um, you, know, you mentioned earlier about agroforestry and the role of you know, ruminant agriculture, linking with agroforestry systems. The reality is there's only been one application for the agroforestry grant scheme in the last year. So there's always great research happening, but where, where do you see the gap being in terms of how you deliver practical initiatives that farmers can actually take up? Jimmy. Again, it's this holistic approach is being able to quantify it, as Wayne says, over the whole system. Uh, and it's been able to reward the farmer for it. Uh, you know, the carbon reductions have to make some money for somebody or be paid for. But it is mostly about being able to take a holistic view to look at the whole system. But what, what does that mean for a farmer, though? Uh, it means that they need to manage their system to reduce carbon uh, emissions, and policy needs to be able to reward them for that. I think another factor, actually, is... is uh, excuse me. An, uh, another factor is... Um, uh, one which is going to be um, really important looking forward is skills on the next generation of farmers and education around some of these key issues. I think that's going to be a major factor as well in terms of, of, of changing uh, this agenda. So I think that's another important area. Is that your role or is that other organisations' role? So in terms of we have, budget, should you be getting SRDP funding to do this? We, we have a significant role in terms of developing the national land-based strategy and delivering it. I think um, uh, it's an important element of what we do. And I think uh, going forward, I think we'll need to grow in importance given the expectations of both climate change, increasing productivity, and also some of the challenges that are facing us in terms of Brexit and new policies. So, yes, we have an important role in that area. Mike, or Weinberg, briefly. But uh, a practical one, perhaps. I mean, I think to, to answer the question, farmers, like all of us, are the same. And, you know, the question will be, what's in it for me? And uh, we have a, a carbon measurement tool, AgriCalc, which has now been incorporated into the work we've just undertaken or started on the beef efficiency scheme, which will provide a measure of carbon emissions on a particular beef unit, and then on the basis of what's taken from that, be able to put that against improvements that they set out, we set out in conjunction with them over the next three years. So. That is then bringing those two things together, bringing together actually the carbon measurement on the one hand, but actually the demonstration for the farm in a very practical sense about financial benefits that come out of making his operation more efficient. And I think that's quite a, that's a challenge for us at a consulting level to really make that demonstrable to the farmer so that he can see the value in his business. It brings it home to him personally. Okay. John Scott. Um, 
There's a, a, what you've talked about is the future generations and the need to understand the, the problems. Um, my colleague and I have been having a brief conversation here, Claudia Bimish and I, um, about it's actually now that we're needing to start with this knowledge transfer or improve that knowledge transfer in the, the current um, generation of farmers uh, such as myself uh, and others. Um, do you see the, the Morden Institute's um, roadshow programme giving you and uh, perhaps other ways that you might wish to outline an opportunity to, to deliver now this um, more uh, effective knowledge transfer um, than, than perhaps has been in the past? Certainly, I think that the, um, our alliance with the Morden will open up a number of opportunities, and you've just touched on one of them. And I think that um, already, I think there are some plans to initiate uh, um, the approaches you've just described, but certainly by using the network of farmers across both organisations, there's a tremendous opportunity to engage with farmers on many of these issues, and I think that direct conduit, conduit into, uh, into the farming community here and now is a major focus and a major plus of this, uh, of this alliance with Morden. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, Donald Cameron. Convener, can I refer to my uh, register of interests and crofting and farming therein? Um, I'd like to come on to the uh, new strategy in a moment, but just uh, in respect of one, one answer you gave relating to Brexit um, and the absence of formal talks with the Scottish Government um, regarding the future of rural support. Um, given that it's been uh, a year and a half since the Brexit vote, does that surprise you? I'd, perhaps having considered my answer, if I just flesh out a little more fully, I think um, the, the discussions, there have been discussions, as, as uh, Wayne said a little bit earlier, at a formal level between our Rural Policy Centre uh, people, and, and that would have been, uh, to a large extent, of providing an evidence base for decision making to, to Scottish Government officials. The other thing that I think is, is relevant is that the four champions which have been set up uh, by the Cabinet Secretary and the work, I think they, they uh, reported back last week and I attended that, and actually the overlap in thinking that's coming out of those groups with uh, where we are and what we see our input being uh, to uh, taking, forward, taking Scotland forward with the challenges that are faced with Brexit are are excellent. There's a there's a good overlap in thinking about the direction of travel and how what the challenges will be and how what we can be doing about them. I think if I could just emphasise the fact that um, there has been engagement and there's been engagement through a rural policy centre at a number of different levels to both officials within Scottish government and to ministers. But I also think it's important that we recognise that uh, SIUC has a major role to play because of its independence. So I think this is, a, this is an area that I think we have made a contribution to and, and would welcome the opportunity to continue making that contribution. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I move on to your new strategy? Um, by which you, you seek to create a much simplified structure and your College of Agriculture and Rural Economy. I'm a great fan of simplification. Um, but could you expand upon the benefits of this new proposed structure um, and uh, how far down the road you have travelled in terms of it, its cost, its impact on staff, uh, and, and when will you, you publish your final vision for, for this? I'll make a start on that, if I may, and then I'll turn to Jamie and to, uh, to Gavin to, to uh, expand. I think the rationale for the creation of this, this entity, and let's not get wound up on what we call it, this entity, is the fact that um, we firmly believe that the integration of research and education is really critical. So exposing our students to the most up-to-date research, inspiring them, is really critical. The second element that is important is that we connect our, our um, uh, um, higher education and further education programs in ways that will support widening access and the learner journey. Those are two areas that we think are of, of, uh, of, of, of critical importance. And third, I think by creating this entity, we will create greater visibility and make uh, SIUC more attractive to future students and indeed would be more kin to what we see around, around the rest of the world. 
What I should add as well is that the model that exists within SIUC is one which is in many ways being re replicated around the rest of the world. So there is, a f there is a strong foundation on which to build, and what we're doing is really looking at integrating our education research uh, provision. And Jamie, would you like to expand on that? Yeah, look, um, the combination of research and uh, uh, learning into one beast seems like a no-brainer to me. Uh, it clearly benefits the learning experience, but actually benefits the research. And I think it overcomes some of the problems we were discussing earlier about getting research into practice, because if there's a close interaction there, it will help that go through. I think as we've worked through this, it's become obvious we need uh, to build even stronger uh, links to our veterinary services and our consultancy. And certainly as we've been planning that, that, that is part uh, of the beast. In terms of where we are in this process, uh, we currently uh, closed uh, last day or so uh, adverts for deans. So uh, our, our principle is to uh, have a regional presence uh, uh, with a faculty in the north of the country, the centre of the country and the south of the country. Uh, those deans adverts closed in the last few days. Uh, we're in the process uh, of interviewing uh, in the run-up to, to Christmas uh, with the view that we'll produce uh, strong regional deans that will then help us drive forward through January uh, the implementation of this new strategy and this integration of our teaching and research activity. Sorry, quick question. How many students do you have nationally? What's your student number? It's about, in total... Uh, and go to the rest. Approximately. Um, seven, seven, seven thousand or so. We've got uh, about 3,000 higher education and uh, slightly more further education, some of who are on part-time courses and okay. so forth. C can I ask about um, SAC Consulting? Um, because I, I visited the, the SAC office in Oban um, earlier on in the year, and uh, it was an excellent office, and its staff are very dedicated. And they it struck me, performed a role that slightly goes beyond, uh, particularly in a very rural area, it goes beyond simply a, an agricultural consultant. Um, they're a lifeline in many respects to, they travel out to the islands, et cetera, to, to, to many of um, the farmers and crofters out there. Um, the new vision, the new strategy, how will, will that change? Uh, will, it, will it make it easier? Will it make it harder? Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm very pleased to hear your comments, and I agree entirely with that particular office. Things are, there's a good dynamic there. Um, I think where we've been institutionally, and of, of all my colleagues, I'm the longest standing of our leadership team, having been here for two and a half years. Um, so what I could comment is that we have been in a place where a lot of staff, not just in consulting, but across the organization, have been in a place where they've been wondering about what our strategic vision is, where we're going institutionally, et cetera, et cetera. Albeit that many of them provide a dedicated and good service in the particular area of the business that they're in. I think the one thing that is going to come as uh, there's a hunger for, and which I think we are in the process of now starting to, to deal with, is more clarity about institutionally where we go, how we fit together, what the vision is for the longer term, and what role people can play in, in, a, in a, a longer term and broader agenda. So I think to that extent, um, the changes that are going through now and which we expect to, to become much more visible in the first and second quarters of next year, I think will, will have an empowering effect to most staff. I think that what we want to do is that we want to maximise the utilisation of all the resources we have in SIUC. And certainly with respect to our consulting staff, we see opportunities for student engagement and indeed engagement with research. Uh, already, I think, Mike, there's a graduate scheme that's been implemented this year uh, to start developing the next generation. And so we don't see uh, our consultants being considered in isolation. Uh, in addition to that, um, we have over 24, approximately 24 vets within SIUC, and I want to see those, uh, those uh, um, vets as well participating in the overall goals and core mission of SIUC in a much, much more integrated way. And we want to break down some of the barriers that have existed in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask where Elmwood College sits in all of this? Elmwood College is a, is a vital uh, plank in our future, uh, in our future development. Uh, it has uh, a number of key strengths which we want to retain and indeed grow. I think the areas of golf, golf and tourism are absolutely critical. The areas around hospitality are also of significance um, yeah. to us. So we see this as being an important uh, um, aspect of our future 
uh, development. It also represents a key uh, community institution which engages with, uh, with, with um, uh, people across in Cooper and across, uh, uh, across Fife. So we're actively engaged at the moment in terms of developing uh, uh, an infrastructure plan with the Scottish Funding Council which will uh, uh, include Elmwood Campus and its future development. And that, that's a marked change from where we were a few years ago. Correct. Right, okay. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Camille. Could I raise a couple of questions around the Inverness campus and declare my interest as a Hans Hans member? There's really two points. And um, the first is some years ago I was involved before 75% of you were involved in post, where there was quite serious staff unrest about the changes. Um, so, A, it's to ask how the staff feel about these changes. And secondly, the Inverness campus model does look exciting. And I want to ask some questions around your thoughts on how you see it grow, innovate, and share best practice with uh, the University of Highlands Islands, for example. So it's really two questions. So we have um, bold and ambitious plans for Inverness. Um, and we're engaging both with um, UHI and Islands and Islands Enterprise in terms of developing that campus. Um, there are major opportunities to develop uh, and expand our competency in epidemiology. We have some excellent researchers there. We also see that there are opportunities for us to be partnering with UHI in terms of digital, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, both agriculture and more broadly. And finally, I think um, um, there are opportunities for us as well to be looking at ways in which we can engage bro more broadly with the two vet schools in Scotland to offer perhaps some training for rural vets. Uh, in addition, there are plans in place to start uh, um, relocating some of our vet facilities. And perhaps, Mike, you'd like to pick that up. And Jamie, you may wish to expand on what I've said. Yes. Um... <clears throat> So from the dark days of 2015 and a lot of difficulties really with people struggling to understand uh, what the impact for them uh, locally was going to be, both internal and external, I would say, as stakeholders that is. Um, I think things have changed significantly. They're probably gaining momentum really over the last six months, uh, starting to get more and more momentum on the basis that the changes that are proposed are seen within a strategic framework and actually... Um, what people can see going forward is that uh, we're not just trying to find uh, small-scale local solutions, but actually it fits into a broader picture. So um, the engagement of, of staff has been fairly intense over the last certainly three months or so, so that actually as we look to designing new facilities and so on, they've got an engagement in that, a, a say in all of that. I think morale will be significantly better now. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Stevenson. Back to Brexit, I understand uh, relatively informally that the UK government is developing perhaps two, three or perhaps four uh, alternative sets of secondary legislation to cover what might happen in uh, post-Brexit to cover different outcomes that they foresee may uh, be the result of the negotiations. I understand that uh, they've thus far uh, not made these available to the Scottish Government, thus making it difficult for the Scottish Government to, uh, to plan for a post-Brexit scenario. Have you seen them, or have you got any informal uh, knowledge of the uh, options that the UK Government are pursuing and playing very close to the chest yet? I'm not aware of, uh, unfortunately, I can't really comment in detail. Um, I uh, am on the Science Advisory Council for DEFRA and have therefore uh, been involved in uh, scrutinising the 25-year environment plan. Uh, but beyond that, I have no uh, direct contact in terms of um, those areas of legislation you refer to. Maybe my colleagues do, but I don't. Um, I, I don't think we've got any particular insights into the uh, legislation they may be proposing, but certainly we have had contact with officials at, uh, in London and we'll have a good idea of some of the, their thoughts uh, in taking things forward. And we think that there's value in making sure that the differences that are uh, relevant to Scotland as opposed to the, from a topographical point of view and a farming point of view, it's really important that those, those points are well understood in, in London. Uh, moving on, John Scott. Um, thank you very much. Um, just a brief question around the opportunities that, again, offer itself. I mean, adversity is always the greatest driver of change there is. And uh, with the likely change to the agri-support systems uh, post-Brexit, um, 
do you see a, an opportunity again for SRUC to go back to how it was once regarded as, you know, leaders in, in rural Scotland in that regard? Um, I do, in declaring an interest, I suppose. But um, do, do, would you want to expand on that just a little? Because I think active farming and, and, and innovation is going to be what will be the necessary order of the day. I think that... Um, uh uh, certainly, I think that SIUC is, is pivotal, not only in terms of delivering on some of the areas we've discussed, but I also think it's, it's critical in terms of agenda setting and being able to set in the future, future agendas and horizon scanning going forward. And therefore, I think that SIUC is actually playing a, an important role. Perhaps we've not been selling that as good as we can. I think we've got to perhaps be a little bit more uh, uh, better at selling much, at, much of what we do. I think uh, the areas that, uh, for example, the development of the AHDB uh, horizon uh, uh, post-Brexit is an example of where I think SIUC is at a major role in terms of, of, of uh, shaping that. In addition, um, going back to um, what is happening with things such as the industrial strategy, uh, where there is an element in terms of uh, future transformation of food, I think SIUC is playing an important role in terms of shaping some of the agenda in those areas. Um, the third example would be our involvement with the agri-tech centres. We are founding partners in three agri-tech centres. One of them is in livestock improvement, the second is in agrimetrics and big data, and the third is in terms of uh, agri-epi, which is precision farming. So we're playing a significant role in terms of that innovation agenda with those three agri-tech centres. And finally, going, going beyond Scotland into um, the work that we're doing uh, with the Gates-founded programme on livestock improvement, we are founding partners with Edinburgh University on the Gates uh, uh, programme for livestock improvement with the International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi. Those are, I think, examples of where we are, are setting the agenda in terms of moving forward. I think um, uh, there's certainly more to be done, but I think creating the confidence and ambition within our staff to take this forward is an important area which we've been, we've been working on the last 14, 15 months. Right. And now to revert the question I was meant to ask. Um, <laughs> members, colleagues will be pleased. Um, I want to talk about the veterinary investigation units and uh, their operation and staff numbers and, and the future of them and uh, the new strategy in 2015. Um, can you fill us in on where all of that's going and are these, are these centres, their future secure? I'll turn to Mike. Yes, uh, so I alluded earlier to the fact that 2015 we had a consultation. We got a lot of pushback from that. Uh, we went back to rethink uh, what was proposed. Um, uh, it, we concluded that most importantly we needed to be in a position where um, local stakeholders uh, had uh, a destination to which they could uh, take their dead cow, in my example. Um, but at a, at a local level, we then provide a service in that manner, in a, in a practical sense, but we also retain local expertise. So uh, the staff at, at any one of our eight centres uh, understand the bigger picture in terms of surveillance, but actually have an understanding of what's going on at, at a regional level or almost on a week-to-week -week basis from a disease point of view, so that, that's, that's an important asset. So we've, everything is around maintaining. We're thinking, in, in all our thinking, we're, we're, we're trying to maintain that infrastructure. But at the same time, we are faced with the challenges that I referred to early, earlier from a budget point of view, and is thinking about how we mold these things into uh, a smarter way of working. So, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing new technologies to the fore, using the benefits of logistics that they are, uh, all of those things need to be incorporated into our, our way of, of uh, doing things going forward. And we've related to the, the uh, central lab and how we want to concentrate expertise into that facility and investment of equipment. We'll find a better way of doing things together with a new partner that we can, uh, we, we can partner up with in Edinburgh. And so essentially what that will then be is, is any duplicated services that they are that we're re reduce the duplication and concentrate on investment in, in smarter equipment, which can actually bring us a better quality of service, a more efficient cost in, in providing that, and quicker turnaround time. So that's, that's the direction of travel uh, that we're moving in. OK, thanks very much. OK, uh, moving on. Um, in these difficult financial times, not just government, every organisation has to look at how it 
spends in the most appropriate and justifiable way. The RACI committee in 2015 took an interest in the remunerations received by uh, the then existing senior executive team and directors. Can I ask Wayne Powell, recognising you weren't involved at that stage, um, wh whether there have been any changes in that regard? And to be clear, I'm not asking for individual remuneration details or packages. I just mean collectively. Is that something SRUC has sought to address? Yes, uh, uh, we've taken uh, um, the views of the RECI uh, uh, committee very seriously. In terms of um, what you see in front of you now, is, uh, is a new leadership team uh, that represents, in part, the, the, uh, the full executive team. Um, one thing I should say in relation to the earlier uh, question, we are in the process of appointing a new finance director, and uh, we were hoping to complete that last week, and we've not been able to, to finalise that, and therefore that is uh, perhaps an omission in terms of, of, of uh, our composition today. So yes, in terms of uh, the executive leadership team, we have uh, scrutinised salaries, we've made appointments, and we now have a leadership team in place that is capable of delivering uh, on the strategy. We seek to make one further appointment in terms of a finance director. In terms of the specific uh, remuneration, perhaps, Gavin, you could explain a little in terms of, the, uh, of, of that and the, 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 um, the, 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 the detail of that. Okay, sure. Um, as Wayne says, there is a non-executive oversight of executive pay, so ultimately that's decided through our appointments and remuneration committee. Um, and they use sectoral benchmarking as part of that, so there is an um, appropriate governance mechanism for that. But in general response to your uh, question, I think there's been significant leadership change over the last year. Um, in 2016, the, the executive management team had um, seven people on it, and now there's six people on it. So we're obviously wary of uh, and conscious of that. And, and has that been matched by a... a reduction in the overall spend in that area? Yes, there's a significant reduction in the overall spend on the executive leadership team. OK. Would you be in a position to provide us with detail on that in due course? You the, detail. Yeah. the The like for like of the executive team last year to this year is 178,000 less. OK. Right. Thank you for that. That's useful. Uh, Kate Forbes. Yeah, on a similar theme, um, there was a report on the um, gender pay gap between 2013 and 2015, which identified approximately um, four pounds um, worth of difference per hour between the women's average hourly rate and the men's average hourly rate. Is anything being done or has anything been done to address the gender pay gap? Would you like to check that? Okay. Well, we've uh, obviously published our gender analysis, and I think we've got a relatively low gap. But um, in terms of development, what we're doing is we have a wide uh, involvement of staff across the organisation in our equality and diversity group. Um, we're consciously aware of the 50-50 by 2020 ambition as well, so that's guiding some of our work with the board. Um, we're looking at areas such as uh, executive leadership development because we believe we have some really good internal uh, women leaders, so that's an area that we're investing in as well. Uh, P Professor Powell's is on the Women in Agriculture Board as well, so w it's an issue that is, we're alive to, I think, relatively. We, we have a, I can't remember, a specific gap, but it, we, we are consciously monitoring that and looking particularly at internal development is one of the ways that uh, we can shift that pay gap. What about the gender balance issue? I mean, how would you characterise the performance or progress of SRUC over the last two, three years in this regard? I think in terms of uh, gender balance on our board, I think uh, we have, I think it's five members, uh, uh, women on that board, which represents approximately a 40% balance. So we're heading towards getting uh, towards the goal. Um, I think um, within, uh, within SIUC, it depends on the various levels within the organisation. Um, one thing that we're clear on is that we uh, need to move forward with our Athena Swan submission. This is a major charter for um, universities and institutes. Uh, we're in the process currently of recruiting a person to support the, the, our next submission. So we're working diligently in terms of driving forward a culture which is compatible with gender balance and many of the issues you've touched on. I think um, uh, we obviously take every opportunity to uh, create committees and groups 
that are uh, appropriately balanced, and we'll continue to do that and work diligently to try and, uh, try and achieve those goals that have been set out uh, by the First Minister. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle and Claudia Beamish. Looking at your, your accounts, uh, Mr Powell, you, in regard to staff costs, can you give, me, give the committee an indication of what percentage pay rise you may be considering to give staff uh, within the next financial round? Uh, we can certainly we can certainly do that. I'll turn to Gavin. I think the uh, the current figure that we're considering is uh, is uh, is it one point seven percent? We actually just had the joint meeting with the trade unions last week, so we're waiting uh, to confirm that in the next week or two. But that's the basis of the discussions we had. Yeah. What's inflation run just now? No. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Uh, just to um, continue the, the line of development of questioning, um, it's encouraging to hear that there's 40 per cent women on the board. I wonder if there's any comment beyond the um, support for development of, um, of uh, people, women who are already in your organisations, uh, in relation to um, the lack of women, uh, as, it, as, as I would perceive it, at senior levels in the organisation at present. Would you like to pick that up? Well, I think one thing we have uh, tried to do, particularly with recent executive appointments, is make extensive efforts to not just passively recruit, but go out and research. So we've worked with uh, headhunters on a research basis. So we've tried to widen the applicant pool for uh, recent appointments. But in some circumstances, with the nature of these roles, it's, it's not been particularly successful, successful in that regard. But we have made an effort to try and encourage candidates, women candidates, for recent So posts. do you have um, future strategies, if that hasn't been successful, as to how you might take those issues forward? Well, I think we will have to review how we recruit as well. I mean, we, specifically for the finance director, that was a key remit of our, of our brief. Um, but we will have to reflect on that and review how we do it. Thank you. Uh, Mike Weinberg, do you want to come in there? And very briefly to that, in the consulting division, we've got 70 per cent women. So just perhaps to lay down a market that it's not entirely that. And certainly if you look at the, um, if you look at the age profile of the younger cohort, we have a significant number of women, uh, which you know, clearly there are all sorts of things that will happen over time as they move towards the senior levels in the organisation. But by virtue of numbers alone, it's, it's, there's a significant change now, I'd say. Okay. And finally, Stuart Stevenson. What's the gender balance of the students? It varies enormously between courses, so um, veterinary, nursing, largely female, pure agriculture, more male. It balances out about 50-50 over the piece. So in, but it's not equal in each course. So in, it's diff, it has historically proved difficult to get women in particular into STEM subjects. That's something with which you're familiar and having to grapple as well. Because, of course, the people who graduate from your education system are a natural pool for those who become part of your staff. Well, I think there are things we can do. So one of the things we're looking at is how we design our courses to give progression. So we see very good engagement at the FE level. One of the things as we go through the strategy, one of the reasons for integrating teaching research is to provide more aspirational HE that the future leaders can come through. So, you know, not why we've designed it, but one of the benefits will be exactly what you've said. Thank you. I think if, if I, may I comment? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that uh, one example, I was teaching last week to a master's programme with about 30 uh, students, of which more than 20, 25, 26 were female. I think really to address um, some of the issues we're referring to, though, we also have to look at out of provision in schools. And that's an area that uh, we're certainly proactive in terms of, of, of developing the rural skills agenda within schools. And I think that is, uh, is important to be able to have a long-term strategic view of how we're going to be addressing some of the issues you're quite rightly raising. Okay. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this morning. I think that's been extremely useful. Um, I, there's a couple of things that you're going to write back to us on, most notably the, um, the loss and disposal of fixed assets. We would appreciate that in the next couple of weeks if you can... We'll, we'll get that back to you promptly, and thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to engaging you going forward. Um, we now move to uh, Agenda Item 3, which is subordinate legislation. Okay. The
The uh, third item on our agenda today is consideration of the following negative instrument, the Water Environment Miscellaneous Scotland Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-389. Uh, can I ask members if they have any comment to make? Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just simply to highlight um, how important this negative instrument is in relation to improving clarity of the present regulations. So I, I simply want it recorded that I, I welcome it on that basis. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments being sought to be made. Um, can I take it then that the committee has agreed it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? We are agreed. Okay, at the next meeting of the committee on the 5th of December, it will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and the Minister for Transport and the Islands as parts, part of its inquiry into air quality in Scotland. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.